cars are fast. Even the BMW. Yeah. That you, you ran That too. BMW is fast. Yeah. Let me tell you about that BMW. He's making a little over 1100 wheel. That car is fast. Yeah. And light too. You have the guy with that very fast BMW. It has what's called a non vandal cylinder head. That head is completely stock. So this head is stock. That has stock valves and stock valve springs. In Texas, Dan Rue is talking to somebody about racing a GTR. They're talking and they're getting ready to run. And I'm like, yo, can I hop in? BMW engineers get paid millions of dollars for two things. One, to design a good car, and then two, to make sure that it breaks the moment it's outside of the warranty period. <laughs> if you're naive enough to believe that you can do 20,000 miles without doing an oil change or 12,000 miles like the dealership is telling you a BMW, that's insane. Why I built the car the way I built it. I got tired of driving and just painting black lines everywhere I went. At the end of the day, spinning ain't winning. Welcome back to another episode of the Street Alpha Podcast. I am your host, Tooks, and today we are in my guy Frank's house. So Frank is the owner of Southside Motorsports, and we had an episode before with Dan Rue, and if you watch the episode, it was mentioned that he raced a very fast BMW. We have the guy right here <laughs> with that very fast BMW. Um, it's the Red Bull. What is it? Red Bull E36. That's what they've called it. They That's call what it they the, call uh, it, right? They call it the Red Bull E36. It kind of stuck a few years ago, and I just let it rock. Um, you know, I ain't going to complain about it. So, so but before we get to the, the whole breakdown <laughs> of the build and so on, let's clap it up for my guy, Frank. <laughs> you gonna edit no, in like there's some... literally nobody here i know us. there's nobody here it's just you know it's just us and we're uh yeah so me and frank have been talking behind the scenes a lot we spent like probably like 45 minutes chopping it up or i would say he's <laughs> kind of schooling me on some stuff um this guy is full of knowledge and one of the main reasons why i wanted to have you on the podcast is because you know so much about like every single platform when it comes to bmw's motors um and you literally built this from the ground up so it's cool because the unique thing about this car is that it's an all-wheel drive e36 yeah so it's the uh it's the first in the states this is the first all-wheel drive e36 mm -hmm. um you know with an iron block m50 which it's the uh is the straight six that comes in these cars right um you know they they had someone had built one in poland a few years ago and a uh, beautiful build, really sick. But they, what they really did was they, they had a E46 all wheel drive car mm -hmm. and they pretty much cut everything out of it and, you know, kind of welded it into that chassis. Right. So when I did this, I did things a little differently. What's crazy is that they crashed that car during testing and it wasn't, you know, it was making like six, 650 wheel horse, but it was in a TI. So it was a little bit lighter, yeah. had like big tires on it, flares, all, you know, big brakes, all this stuff. Um, it was a really cool build. I remember seeing it. It was a lot of people saw it. It was like, you know, probably like six or seven years ago, maybe more. Yeah. And they crashed it during testing. And during my testing, I think I know why they crashed it. Um, and it has to do with the suspension geometry. When you go, when you change it from rear wheel drive to all wheel drive, these cars never came all wheel drive. The chassis never came all wheel drive anywhere in, mm -hmm. you know, anywhere in, in, the, in right. the world. Um, so what ended up happening was like, I used to, you know, I used to chase a lot of horsepower. Um, you know, I used to hang around a lot of people that were making, you know, 12, 13, 1400 horsepower and they're going out racing and, yeah. you know, I want to be a part of that. Or, you know, we're going to Texas and it's like, yo, it got potential. It's got more potential. It's got more in it. And, you know, it gets to the point where, you know, especially in a rear drive car, a lot of people are going to relate to this. You're only as you're only going to, you know, put down as much power as you can on any given road. Mm. So. At the end of the day, you never really race in a rear, in a high horsepower rear wheel drive or front wheel drive car for the matter. Yeah. You're never really racing the person you're racing, the person you're, that's next to you. What right. you're racing is the right. road. And, you know, you you got a 27, 2800 pound rear wheel drive car and you're throwing 12, 1300 horsepower at it. It's never going to it's not going to stick. Yeah. You know, you got Vipers that they make 2200, 3000 horsepower. They don't put that down at 50, 60 miles an hour. Yeah. You know, they could call me a liar all they want. They don't put that <laughs> down at that speed, you know? So, like, they have boost by gear, their MoTeC, their traction control, everything to manage the power. So, at the end of the day, I had good power delivery. Yeah. And I had a T56 Magnum, which I got from Granis. You know, I then I broke that, which you can break those. And, uh, you know, I ended up building it. I sent it back to him. I got a GR1000, threw it in the car, and, like, the thing shifted like butter. And it took everything 
you know, I used to hit it with nitrous, 40, 40, 50 pounds of boost, whatever. And, um, you know, that trainee took it, but the road wasn't taking it. Mm. So then I cut up the car, I put 28s on it, wasn't working, you know, and I didn't like the 20 way the 28s looked. The thing looked like, you know, it looked like a lifted, it looked like a monster truck. I, right. I did not like it at all. And I, I decided, you know what, I'm going to make it all wheel drive. I said, all wheel drive BMWs are killing the game. This is around the time when, you know, when like Dre with his 340 was, yeah. was doing work. Right. And, you know, and you give it up to the kid. Like, yo, you know, he came out here with a 340 with basic stuff on it. Yeah. And some good tuning, good support. You know, a lot of good guys behind the car. And, um, you know, you see all wheel drive BMWs working. The issue that those cars always had, though, was drive trim malfunction. You know, you had like, you get the car in limp mode. Yeah. The training gets too That's hot. The biggest it thing, does yeah. this, it does that. You know, and I didn't want that. And the other problem was, is that my car would work on a 26. I didn't like the 28s at all, but my car would work on a 26 if they were fresh. Mm. Every 10 hits, I had to change the tires for it to hook again. After 10 hits, they were cooked. You had a brand new set of ET Street R's, They're like 450 $500 for the pair. Yeah. Bro, every 10 times I go out, I'm spending $500 on a set of tires. That's insane. <laughs> Next, you're going to go broke. You're going to go broke, what, chasing a 61 30 time that no one cares about? Right. So I said, you know what, man? Let's make it all dry. Let's be different. And, you know, sometimes the idea comes together. You're very good at, like, um, engineering, right? Yes. Have- well, I mean, uh, yeah, so I, I graduated with an engineering degree from uh, Farmingdale College. So I, um, you know, it was automotive engineering. And, you know, you go in there. They had a, they had a very good program. But, you know, things change over the years. Yeah. They, you know, you, they had, like, some, some older dudes that were there uh, that they were drag racers. One of them was a drag racer. Mm. And old old school he would you know he would curse in class he would you know he would say you ain't gonna break nothing with that fucking forward you know he would say stuff like that anyway he taught you a lot of stuff and a lot of basics Mm -hmm. and as much as he was a boomer he was right he's been racing for 50 60 years yeah you know like what he tells you is right Mm -hmm. what he ended up teaching you was was that you ain't gonna break nothing with no fucking horsepower that was like his line so you're not going to break anything with any horsepower. What you say you're not going to break nothing with no horsepower, with no which horsepower. is okay. a double negative if you want to get technical. Right, right. But yeah, that's how you used to say it. And, uh, you know, once you start, you know, you start turning it up, you're going to start breaking stuff. So I was like, all right, you know what? Let me, I, I got the entire car figured out rear wheel drive. Mm-hmm. All right, this car, I can drive it all day, 850, 900 wheel. And it'll kind of hook second gear. Yeah. But then after that, it's like, you know, it, it's, it's out. Car's right. good. Um, so I said, like, all right, let's, let's make it all wheel drive. Let's look into, you know, how we're going to, I got, I got to, you know, underneath the, um, you know, subframe had to be different. The knuckles had to be different. Mm-hmm. The, uh, you know, I, I kind of started to work out a plan before doing it. Yeah. And I started to gather up parts here. I get like, you know, I, I reach a part out. I get like, all right, axles here, you know, transmission here, this, that, and the third. And, uh, then it came time to put the plan into motion the amount of things that you have to work around to make this to make that car all-wheel drive, work all-wheel drive is absolutely wild anybody wants the recipe just add me okay <laughs> i i will give you here and there if you want to try to figure it out figure it out yeah i never been a gatekeeper but yo i sometimes i had some customers reach out to me yo how much all-wheel drive my car i'll tell them yo 15 20 grand 15, 15, 20 grand. Is that how much it costs you? Or is that just because of the labor and your experience? That's, that's, that's because of the labor and, and what I, okay. what I know. And what now. you know, right. At the end of the day, it might be, you know, it might be seven to $8,000 in parts, which is still a good amount, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, okay, what's another six, seven grand on top in labor and fabrication costs. Mm-hmm. That's not even a lot when you think about it. Yeah. You know, you got people upcharging like crazy, right? You know, it was uh, it was a big change for the car, and I got a lot, I got big things big things planned for this year. I'm really i I ended up turning the I ended up turning the car down, and I'm having so much more fun with it. You know, I ended up I used to go twelve thirteen hundred horsepower everywhere I went. Yeah. Now I got the car at a thousand, and you know, it is nine day difference. I've had more fun with this car in the last three four months than I had within like four or five years. Mm. You know, even with all that Texas stuff. Yeah. You know, I go out on sunrise high. I go out, you know, local roads over here, whatever, and just you know, beat the brakes off some brand new nine eleven or some G eighty, whatever the case is. They they pull up next <laughs> to me. They have no idea they that this no thing's idea. gonna do what it does. <laughs> and you know, I I come up and I do my you know do my thing, and then I just you know send them packing. Yeah. So with that platform the way it was set up, 
do you think that you were putting all the power down when it was rear wheel drive? Um, at the time, I wasn't. And okay. the reason for that is because I was still stock computer. Um, ah, okay. Back then, my car was uh, my car was stock computer, arcade tuned. Um, you know, he did a very good job, and he still does to this day. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a certain there's a certain level where I feel like you can just maximize the most out of your car. You know, going to a standalone. Okay. You know, you can add you know you can add fuel pressure safeties, oil pressure safeties, mm-hmm. which these are things that those you know you can build the perfect engine. You can put everything brand new in an engine, and people who race will tell you this. Sometimes shit happens. You know, you get a bad oil pump out the box. You know, you, you know, you got a bearing that's starting to go bad. It gets, it goes into the oil pump. It's done. You get a brand new fuel pump that was, you know, giving you no issues at all. Next thing you know, it pops the fuel pump and your fuel pressure crashes during the pull. Mm-hmm. You're not watching your gauge. You know, half the time you're not watching your gauges. You're racing or you're beating on the car. You're looking straight. Right, right. You know, so that's, that's something true. like I feel like it is very important to do. And then not only that, but the boost by gear in a rear wheel drive car. If I, if, if I had a standalone and I was probably rear wheel drive, and I was probably you know boost by gear rear wheel yeah. drive still, I'd probably I would have probably stayed rear wheel drive, you know. But it was really just me wanting to do more with the car and me wanting to just you know be different. Mm-hmm. You're probably this car has been turbo for I want to say maybe eight nine years. This car has been turbo. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it started out with a simple four or five hundred horsepower build. Okay. And now it doubled. You know, it's. Yeah. But it's it changed so much, and I used to daily this car. I used to go, I used to drive this to college. You know, when it was turbo, I used to drive it to college all day. You know, I I enjoy driving the car, and for me to enjoy the car at the track, yeah, I would have had to put a cage in it, which right. I absolutely did not want to do. You know, this is something that you know me and my fiance jump in, and we'll drive this to dinner. We'll you know we'll she loves this stuff, so we'll be like, all right, let's go to a car meet, or you know, let's go get lunch or whatever. And we're yeah. just out cruising in the car. So I was at the point with the car where it was like, okay, I got to put a cage. And I have to put a straight axle. The okay. IRS was just not doing it. Um, there are plenty of guys that have these chassis that make them work with IRS, but they have automatics. What, so what, what's IRS? Uh, independent rear suspension. Okay. So you know the uh, the suspen- the differential is mounted to the chassis, mm-hmm. and then the suspension allows it to move up and down. Okay. Which is good for you know street cars it's right. good for um you know track track cars and not i'm not talking about quarter mile track cars i'm talking about um you know like road racing and stuff like that right. which the bmw is made for the more spirited driver which is going to take it on back roads or you know wants to cruise on the highway and then take some turns with it whatever that's right, what bmw right. is made for the driving feel and um i i had hit up a few guys for quotes on you know that do chassis work to do uh to do a uh, 8.8 or a nine inch conversion and then mm-hmm. do it um a cage you know eight second certified cage yeah and i was probably this close to doing it and then i said i think i saw like another video of an all-wheel drive honda i was like man fuck that uh, let's go all-wheel <laughs> drive and then that was it and then, and then the rest is history after that i put my mind to it i drew up a plan i started getting parts started making things work and i'm like all right, right this is gonna be like this is gonna be like this i ran into a few issues that still to this day are not bothering me, but they're just not where I want them to be. Right. And that's why I was saying where I think the other, the the car that they had built, the first all-wheel drive E36 that was in Poland, yeah. that they crashed it during testing. These cars, they're very neutral. Um, kind of like how your Supra is. Mm-hmm. If you ever like, you know, if you ever like punch in the rain or anything like that and the car kind of kicks out. It's snappy. Ve- it's snappy, but yeah. you counter steer it a little bit and it's very natural. The car kind of just right. walks back and it's very balanced. Yeah. BMWs are like that. Mm-hmm. You're welcome, Toyota. Which is why, which is why probably the S2000 kind of yeah, you know. the you know S2000 MR2 stuff like that. They, Similar. They, they, Similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the S2000 is better, but the MR2 is yeah. very snappy. We don't like that. Um, but BMWs are very neutral, and E36 is even more so. I've been driving these cars turbo for a long time, and I've been you know beating the hell out of them and driving them really hard. Mm-hmm. What ends up happening is that the car kicks out a little bit. You counter steer it like any other rear drive car, right? Not like Mustangs though. We <laughs> Joe covered that. Joe covered that in another episode. Yeah. Um, the car, car counter steers a little bit and it straightens out. You can either lift or stay in it. It'll straighten out and it won't it won't give you too much drama. Yeah. But with the all-wheel drive, what ends up happening is that the entire drive line sits about an inch and a half or two inches forward, and the wheel sits forward also. So that mm. now your center line of the wheel is more forward, but your shock tower doesn't change. And now, even with like the most aggressive caster or camber. Um, adjusters up top yeah the caster is almost fully out 
So like what the caster does is that it allows the wheel to return to center without too much drama. That's okay. why motorcycles have the more caster they have, the more they want to drive straight. Right. Motorcycles have the shot have the uh you know the forks that go forward right, and right. that's the caster. So think of your suspension mounting point on the on the car the same mm-hmm. way. When you move the entire center line of the wheel forward, right, your caster is now f- almost fully gone. What ends up happening is like when the car starts to starts to slide, you try to you try to steer it right, you try to you know correct, it. you try to counter steer it, mm-hmm. and what ends up happening is that it starts snapping, and now you get an unstable you know um, flip back and forth, right, and it's been sketchy a few times, and that's why I think. They crash that car during testing. Mm. The other thing also, um, something that I learned about when you're going all-wheel drive. Yeah. Um, I When I did the all-wheel drive system on this car, I made the front and the rear gearing different. Okay. So, like, you know, people say, all right, when people cars go all-wheel drive, you have to have the same, uh, you have to have the same tire in the front and the back. Right. And the reason for that is because if the tires are mismatched, you'll tear up the transfer case or you'll tear up the differentials. Or the transmission. The whole thing is mm-hmm. going to get messed up if your tire sizes are wrong and it's not made to be like that. But what I ended up happening was I have a longer gear in the front. So I have a uh, I have a 3.07 ratio front diff. And I have a 315 ratio rear diff. And, with that in, and now what that allows me to do is to keep a staggered tire so that the car still looks rear wheel drive. You couldn't tell that it was, you know, you, yeah. you would look at the car and you'd be like, all right, yeah, BMW, bigger tires in the back, small tire in the front. That's normal. Not this one. You know, I did it like that so that the mo- so that I can have the staggered tire. But the other thing is also you have to calculate then the mile an hour in every single gear for the tire size that you're going to run. Oh, okay, okay. That's what we kind of spoke about earlier. It yeah to, which we so, can get into um can you talk about that what we spoke about earlier in terms of like gearing and and before so, we even get into the whole the whole outline of the all-wheel drive yeah system. so yeah the, the what we were talking about was that uh that a lot of people say that bmw that if you had a bmw and a mopar or you know a, a chevy yeah. with the same horsepower that the bmw is going to beat it normally and and you know they say it's because of you know the power delivery or just the you know the the chassis or it's so much lighter the real reason is because of the gearing so bmws for a long time and this is before the zf8 and all that they always had the correct like a very very good close ratio transmission that wasn't too aggressive um hondas are very notorious for having a close ratio transmission what that means is that the ratio percentage drop from one gear to the next is very small. So if you're at the limiter in first gear and it's like eight or 9,000 RPM, you hit the next gear, it only drops back like, you know, two, maybe 2,500 RPM. Yeah. And it keeps you in that power band so that it rips through the next gear. Right. Right. And you do that on cars that have less torque. And the reason for that is because the gearing is your torque multiplier. So okay when you have more aggressive gearing, it'll rip through the gear faster. And when you have more RPM, you'll get the same mile an hour as a car that has longer gearing, but less RPM, you know? Okay. And the, and what ends up happening is that the reason that BMWs are really good, and this is what it is, this is what I think is because they've always, they've had fifth gear be the one-to-one in their manual transmission cars. So you got first, second, third, fourth, are all multipliers so the cars are pulling much harder in those gears when you say multipliers though can you kind of explain a little um, bit um basically it like is give me a, a basic example it's a gear basic. ratio over the one-to-one okay and one-to-one is, is, is one-to-one one. is direct drive so okay. uh in a manual transmission when you hook when you hook you know normally on like domestic most domestic cars yeah. and um some other cars when you hit fourth that's your one-to-one gear that is input shaft connected to the output shaft and that is pretty much your engine turning the differential. Okay. Now, any gear below that is a multiplier. What that means is that it's a ratio greater than one. Okay. And when you have a ratio greater than one, it gives you one times that for the power. So let's say, let's say your first gear is 4.2 or 4.0 okay. for easy. That's four times the amount of torque than you would get from your engine. In fifth gear, you're getting it times four. Okay. Okay. And that's spitting it to the rear wheels. That's why you get the yank. Now the car goes, now you hit the next gear, which let's say it's a two, it's a two to one ratio. Mm -hmm. Now that 
okay, now you're getting twice the amount of torque that you would get from your fifth in that. And it's written, it's pull, propelling the car forward. You end up, you have to find the perfect balance. You can go too far one way and the car feels like a dog and you can go too far the other way and the car has no top end. Right. So the reason that I feel like being was always very, very competitive is because you had a car like, you know, the older ones, you had a car that came with two, like the E36, you had a car that came with 240 horsepower mm -hmm. and they had a uh, good ratio transmission where first, second, third, fourth were all on, were all over the one to one gear. And then fifth was your one to one gear. Right. So now the car feels good. It rips and you were racing cars that, you know, they were making, if you, I never lost to a 350Z. <laughs> like, stock, I, a stock, like stock gearing, you mean? Like stock, I mean, uh, stock, stock uh, 350Z? Not like, a, you know, like a bolt-on, like intake exhaust, tune, okay. whatever. You know, I never raced my car when it was stock. It was, you know, when it was stock was, uh, you know, all motor. Right. Obviously, I had headers, you know, I had an intake. I had a tune. Uh, shout out to RK always. You know, he always used to tune my car. Um, so why so why didn't you why didn't you ever lose to a 350Z? Well, no, what I mean is um, it was the gearing on those cars is... That's what I mean, yeah. Right. Yeah, the gearing on those cars was just, I feel like it wasn't optimal for it. Okay. You know, they might have had longer gearing um, where it's not taking full advantage of the power band. Mm. And BMW engineers get paid millions of dollars for two things. One, to design a good car, and then two, to make sure that it breaks the moment it's outside of the warranty period. <laughs> and that that's something that... <laughs> Listen, man, and if you if you know if you don't think that if you if you're naive enough to believe that you can do twenty thousand miles without doing an oil change, like from a Land Rover or twelve thousand miles, like the dealership is selling you a BMW, that's insane. They're doing it because they want your car to fail. The moment it gets outside the warranty period, they want your car to fail because they want you to buy a new car or spend thousands of dollars in the service department on a repair. Crazy. Do you really think that? Oh, absolutely. It, it's evident in every in every BMW in, in pretty much every older BMW you can see it. So like perfect example, E36 is all came with plastic radiators. You know every every they came with plastic thermostat housings, plastic. Water, I was going to say the plastics, pumps, yeah, literally plastic everywhere. Right, they still do. And what fails? The plastic, and it's not that it fails immediately. It fails from it getting hot and cold, hot and cold. Like right. you know, it's getting weathered. Now it gets more brittle. It gets harder because the temperature is making it harder. It's rearranging the molecules in the in the plastic and is making it more brittle. The harder you make something, the more brittle it is, the easier it is to break. The right. reason for that is because, you know, it's not malleable anymore. It won't bend. It won't, you know, it has no give. Yeah, yeah. And they're they make the cars, they make the car, they make the engines very good. The engine's gonna be, you know, except for the B fifty eight oil pump and shit they got going on right now, whatever. They they got that sorted though, mm -hmm. but that, you know, that's happens um <laughs> they they make the engines very good and very easy to work very easy to service but everything around the engine now you know those cars they don't have the problems yet but like n54s and n55s dude you got water pumps you got every single gasket on the engine leaking out of nowhere yeah that was mentioned you know, before those yeah. things they all happen you know mm -hmm. and you know you have a lot of engines where um you know they they've always designed good engines and they work like you know the s65 that engine's great. That's the V8 M3 from the E92. Mm -hmm. That engine, you know, people could talk about how slow it is all the time. If you want a track car, if you want like a circuit track car, yeah, you get that engine. You put it in any BMW, the thing's going to be a rocket. You can keep it in that chassis too. It's going to be great. Yeah. It's just a little heavier. Mm -hmm. But that's a great, you know, it'll rev to 84, 8,500 RPM all day. It's an over square V8 where the bore is larger than the stroke. Okay. So you get much better fill over fifty two over fifty two hundred RPM. You get much better cylinder fill, and the thing just rips above that. And it has very aggressive gearing because it doesn't make enough torque. So now they mop it up with the gearing. So now you mentioned before BMW engineers get paid millions of dollars to to figure this this stuff out, right? Yeah. So you said it has very aggressive gearing. So why do you think that the the a three fifty Z, for example, doesn't have aggressive gearing? Why didn't they get well, that right? They may, they have good transmissions. You get like a you know you get a CDO nine, which is a decent training. A lot of people swap them mm -hmm. into things, um, but about you know about the three fifty, I'm not too keen on them. All I'm saying is that I've never you know that I used to race stuff like that when. Well, just I was as an example, motor. like because you brought and, it up, so I just figured it like to kind of feed off of that. And um, I think what it is is like they. Yeah, it's an enthusiast car built by Nissan. 
Perfect. Okay. Okay. But you know, you have, you know, a lot of them came automatic. You get, you know, you get a manual one, but a lot of them came with open differentials, mm -hmm. you know, and the car wasn't, you know, it was like, it was like a toned down version of its best, you know, of its best day. Now, if you had a Nismo, um, you know, it came with all the bells and whistles, right? Much better, right? You know, better diff and everything. And those cars were a little more aggressive. Um, still never lost one though. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know what? My boy that has a turbo one in, in Deer Park. Yeah. Uh, with the purple one, the carbon, he's mm -hmm. going to call me out. Watch. He's going to be like, yo, <laughs> I got a 350 for you. Don't worry. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, the, you know, those cars, they, I just, I feel like they were lacking in certain aspects. You know, you had, you have a car that came out 12, 13 years later and it's, you know, it's, you still have this nineties, you know, box that's keeping up with a lot of newer cars. You know, I used to have a, I used to have a blast when I was used to drive my car on motor. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, I had a, uh, I had a straight six swap from an E46 that wasn't an M3. It was an M54 B30, which is a three liter aluminum block. Very similar to the uh, iron block that comes in the car, mm -hmm. but it's just all aluminum. So it's lighter. The compression is a little different, whatever. The car was making like 200 and I think it's like 250 or 260 wheel. And the chassis was light. So it was making like 20, it was like 27 or 2,800 pounds. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed that a lot. I raced it a lot. And, you know, I raced a bunch of old motor cars, you know, whatever, TL type S, um, you know, it's like some bolt-on Camaros that weren't built right. Because if you catch one that's built right, good luck, bro. You get like <laughs> right. an LS1 Catfish Camaro from, you know, 2001, whatever, and they're built right old motor, forget about it. You're going you're gonna to have your hands full. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you're having a little fun with your two, 250, 300 horsepower car. It doesn't have to all be 1,000 horsepower. You know, you said you want to make your car have a thousand wheel. I feel like you're going to ruin the car, to be honest. On the, on the Supra? Yeah, I feel like you're going to ruin it, man. You know, like, yeah, you, if you want to race it, hell yeah. If you want a to Dyna thousand, Queen, for sure. I feel yeah. like the sweet spot for really any rear wheel drive car that's like around that weight, I feel like the real sweet spot is like that like 750, 850 range. Mm -hmm. It's just, it, it hits hard. You don't have to give up so much bottom end for your top end. You know, they say, oh, you can have a thousand horsepower on a spool. Great. But yeah, you got to hit it with nitrous. Yeah. You know, you got to do all these tricks to make spool. You got to get like a $4,000 turbo. Who wants that? You want to build a car. It's, you want it to be fun. You, you know, at the same time, you don't want to spend tens of thousands of dollars building it. Right. You know, if you want to get bolt-ons and throw it on and have fun, that's, that's really what it's all about. But to me, I feel like most rear wheel drive cars that are around that weight, like the right around that 3000 range. Yeah. I feel like. If you want to really enjoy it on the street and drive it a lot, that 750, 800 range is the best. Yeah, that sounds about, that sounds about right. But you want to make a thousand. Yeah. <clears throat> I never had a car that was like a, a thousand horsepower. The most I made was, like I said, 525 on the S2K, which is pretty much similar to probably, yeah. To get that same feeling out of my car, probably like what, like 600, mm, 600, 700 horsepower? Yeah, like 600, 700. I mean, the, what, you had AP1? AP2, 2.2. Okay, so AP2 had a little more torque. Car was a little heavier, though. I yeah. was like 3,200 pounds, like 31, yeah. right around there. Yeah, that's that's about the same. The, the, the S2000? Yeah. I think it was like 20, I thought it was 2,900. With you in it? I was, bro, I was skinny back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but S2, okay, so, you know, people, the cars are small, yeah. but the chassis has to be stronger because it's a convertible. Right, and, you exactly, know, and yeah. That's the thing. So, like, yeah, if it wasn't a convertible, you can gut all that, put a hard top on it, mm -hmm. and make it super light, and the car's like 25, 2,400 pounds. You can do that. Yeah. But, you know, at that point now, it's rattling. I don't like driving cars on the street that are rattling left and right. I enjoy, <laughs> you know, I like my radio. I like my heated seats. That's, the, that's going back to the whole thing where I didn't want to cage my car. Right. You know, I, I love just jumping in it, going to the store. I go to the supermarket. I have fun. I, whatever. I... I'm, I'm flexing everywhere I go. I'm not yeah. flexing on a trailer 24-7, which is what I used to do. You know, yeah. I used to throw my car on a trailer, go race and go to Poconos, go to North Carolina, Texas, whatever, and have fun racing the car. But, mm. bro, it's just, it just, it takes all the fun out of it. Yeah. You know, like, what, I enjoy my car five, six times out of the year. We work too hard for that. Yeah, that's true. You know, I, I, I like driving my car to work. I drive my car to my shop and then. You know, my customers show up and they're like, yo, you brought the car out? Hell yeah, let's go for a <laughs> ride. And I, I take my customers for a spin all the time. You know, it's, it's, it's what I love doing. Yeah. You basically built this car from the ground up, right? And mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people um, 
who are really true BMW fans, they really appreciate the E36 and the older style cars, right? More, normally, you would see like the older style cars and like VBS wheels and stuff and so on, or you see like a car like yours who people put money into it. Um, Jordan mentioned on his podcast or his episode that your your car is sort of like an anomaly to the other ones that are built, right? Well, what makes yours what makes yours like so unique? Why do you think he felt that yours? Um, is more of an the reason he too? said that the reason he said that is because um, a lot of E36s are built around a uh, a longer stroke. They, they, they try to do a, a more of a undersquare engine. Okay. So, uh, which is an undersquare engine is where you have a longer stroke than you have a bore. And what that does is it gives you great spool characteristics and great around town. Mm -hmm. um, but what it lacks is it lacks the up top. It lacks the high RPM. And, you know, I, I grew up around imports where RPM is where it's at. Yeah. You know, right. you, you love hearing, you know, rotary singing eight, 9,000 RPM. You got a B series going to 10. You know, I got, I got one of my, be one of my best friends has a, has a, has a B series Del Sol. Mm -hmm. And I think at a 1.6 liter in it, he revs that, I think he revs it like 10 or 10 or 11,000 RPM. The thing is, you know, yeah, it's up there. Right. And when it comes down to it, I just love the way it sounds. You know, it, you rev it high. It sounds really good. Um, and you get. The, the trade-off that you get, and this is where it all started. I was in college, and I'm sitting here, and we were in engines class. And in engines class, they're teaching you, they're like, yo, horsepower equals torque times RPM divided by 5252. Five, Write that down. The, Wait, you, horsepower you, equals? Horsepower equals torque, torque divide, time, times, times RPM divided okay. by 5252. Five, why 5252? Five, five, that is the standard. That okay. is where, if you have an all-motor car or uh, even some turbo cars, that's where the, if you ever look at where the dyno plots cross, it'll mm -hmm. cross at 5252. Five, oh, shit. Okay. The, okay. Do you know how you can tell when people mess with dyno numbers and, yeah. and figures? Is when you see, the, you, do, you see the cross that happened at a different RPM. That's when they, do, that's when they doctor or Photoshop you know, dyno stuff. And people do that. There are people in the BMW community that Photoshop dynos. No, I haven't seen anybody do it in the last few years. It's not hard to do a Photoshop. Oh, a it's not hard. But when I'm looking at the dyno graph and it's crossing at 6,500 RPM and you're like, wait a second, this doesn't make any sense. And then he's making the most power of anybody and the car don't do numbers. You know, it has no good, it has no good quarter mile time. Yeah. Every race he's losing. It's like, bro, at that <laughs> point, you know, you're like, wait a second, something's wrong here. Yeah. Um, what ends up happening is that I read that and I was like, okay, torque breaks things. That's the force. Mm -hmm. You can have your gear multiplier. What ends up happening is that if you have lower torque, you're going to, you know, your drive line is going to be safer. Okay. You have, you know, when I, when I was building this car originally, I didn't have the money to, to throw 20, 30 grand into a car. Yeah. I was a college student. You know, I would, I was dealing this car still. So, you look at it and you're like, all right, the transmission's designed for 300 horsepower. Okay. The differential's designed for 300 horsepower. Mm -hmm. The drive shaft, everything, everything in the car is designed for 300 horsepower. Yeah. And 300 foot pounds of torque. So now what can you do? Okay, you double it. That's a safe bet. You can realistically, most cars, except for the Mopars that come built from factory. Right. You know, right, I've got to be right. controversial. Obviously. Um, <laughs> I was you say. can pretty much double the horsepower of most cars, like the, not the wheel horsepower. You can pretty much double like the like factory crank horsepower of most cars and most driveline parts on the car will survive. For how long, though? Well, that's that's the million dollar question. OK. And that's what the engineers get paid a lot of money for. <laughs> so, you know, you have. You know, you got a K series, right? Yeah. You got a K series, 250 horse, something like that mm -hmm. stock. You double, you make 500 wheels. That's about, you know, 500 wheels, like factory valve covered oil pan case series. That's yeah. pretty reliable. That's like about the limit. This is like the safe limit. Right. Um, you know, same thing with all the rest of the parts around it. You have a BMW engine. Now I'm sitting here and a lot of guys, are they're like, they're breaking diffs, they're breaking trannies. And they're making like six, 700 horsepower. They're also making six, 700 foot pounds of torque. Yeah. I was like, all right, if I keep the torque lower, I can make the same horsepower and not break everything. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? Smaller engine destroked engine or you can start out with this you know with the smaller engine which is what this has this has a 2.8 which is m52 b28 
Okay. That engine is as square as it gets. It's an 84 millimeter bore and 84 millimeter stroke. So, okay. So when you talk about square, right? Yeah. Like you just said, 84 millimeter bore and stroke, mm-hmm. right? Now, what, are the, what, if, what if those numbers are skewed? Um, so if you have an... If you have a long, if you have a bigger bore, right. that is a that is a uh, over square. Oh, so it's if you have a bigger bore, it means it's over. If square. you have a larger bore, it's over square. Okay. If you have a longer stroke than your bore, that's an under square engine. So the bore is basically the the how it's wide the piston. It's, it's the, the, it, the cylinder it, yes. or the piston itself. It is the it is well to get really technical. Um, the bore is the bore is the hole where the piston goes. Right. Let's say the bore is eighty four millimeters. Mm-hmm. The piston is normally like eighty three point nine nine nine. It's like really close. It's like very close to eighty four. But if you went to eighty four, it would seize. You know, it wouldn't. So it, it wouldn't that, work. Is when you're building an engine, are these things that are like I guess um mess with a little bit to kind of yeah kind of well different... it all depends you know a lot of times you get an engine where you take it apart and everything looks good you can keep the same bore mm. um there are some engines where you can't do that right there are some engines where you take them apart and it's like all right you know you have a vertical you have like a you have scratches or you have damage in the yeah, bore right now you got to go half over that's like the standard okay um you know you go half over you get a quarter quarter over what ends up happening is that you 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 know if you have a steel block is very simple okay um to me, always, iron block will be king. Iron block is always, think about it. You have, you have more material. The block, is, you don't have an open deck versus closed deck issue, um, like on some, you know, aluminum yeah. block engines. Uh, you don't have any of that spray on liner stuff like the B58, B58 the S58, yeah. S55. The plasma, that plasma. That, that, yeah. that spray Coding on liner is, you know, it works. Yeah, great. You guys can make 12, 1300 horsepower with it, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you tear through it, now you got to sleeve it or you got to get another block. Right. If you have an iron block, you build it. Something happens. You drop a valve. You tear it apart after four or five seasons. It's kind of, you know, it's got some scratches. You got to clean it up a little bit. You still can go larger. You can go half over. You can go a little bit more. And they said normally you can either they sell a piston for it or you can order a piston that's a little, you know, that's custom. Mm Mm-hmm. And you clean up the bore, the block's still good, you put your thing back in the car, you go and have fun. What is the point of running everything on the ragged edge? You know, <laughs> it's true. like, yo, it's I get it, dude. I yeah. I was there for a long time. But I'm being I'm being so real with you right now, is that people get so wrapped up in horsepower numbers and like wanting to be the best out there always. And I love that. Keep pushing for it. Yeah. But I feel like I, not to be a Miata guy or anything, but yo, <laughs> like, you know, you got to have fun when you're driving. Right. You know, what's what's fun if, if every single time you're driving the car, you got to throw race gas in it. Mm-hmm. You got to put your slicks on it. You got to warm up the tires. You know, you got to, you know, you got to get your bead locks on there that you're driving on the street. And next thing you know, you hit a New York pothole and what happens? Yeah. You're on the side of the road waiting for a tow truck. What's mm-hmm. the fun in that? Nobody likes that. No, I, that's why, I think that's why most cars sit. You know, people get, you know, discouraged. You know, that, and a lot of people, people go full circle. Yeah. But the thing is, in New York, it's very, in New York, it's different. I feel like here, we have, we have so many different communities. You have your, you know, you have your drag racers. You know, you got your guys who, you know, are enjoying their cars and they're doing some road racing because they want to break their cars when they're drag racing. Yeah. You know, unpopular take, whatever you want to say. Uh, you got your people who go to circuit tracks. You know, you have, you have people who auto X. You know, you got it all. So I feel like here you have a little bit of everything. Um, but what I what I really think makes it fun is just building your car how you want. And, you know, and going out there, not caring if the next person has more horsepower than you or whatever. Yeah, that's fun. I love going out and be like, yo, I got the baddest shit out here right now. <laughs> Everybody loves that. I feel it. you know, you go out there, your ego gets inflated. Yeah. You know, it's fun. But, man, you know, you're going out there and pushing the limits for so long like i i would put a i would put an engine in this car and just crank it all the way up and seeing what it'll do yeah you know i i we took stock engines to 7 720 750 wheel horse and a little 2.8 that was built in 1995 like yeah you know at the end of the day it's fun yeah you push the limits you find it but i i do that for my customers you know like i do that so i know how far my customers can push 
but I won't, you know, I'm not, I'm not, if you came into my, if you came into my shop and you're like, yo, I want to build my car on the ragged edge. I don't care if it blows up. I'm gonna say no. I'm gonna say no, because when it blows up, I'm gonna look like the bad guy. But I think that, um, it's been mentioned before also, like if you had a customer that came into your shop and looking to, you know, push it to the limit on a platform that you haven't been, you know, that you haven't had yourself. Let's say if I said, I want to take my car to your shop and I want to just go crazy. Are you going to say no to me though? No, I'm, we're going to do it. Yeah. So if I blow my motor though, right, that means that I was pushing my car to the limit. It's possible. Right. It's also possible that something failed. Right. You know, like you, can, you said before. Yeah, yeah. You, things happen. Yeah. You know, it, in a perfect world, nothing, nothing would go wrong. Right. But, you know, this is racing and yeah. dude, anything can happen. You know, and sometimes you feel bad, you know, sometimes you feel bad, things happen and, you know, you try to help, you know, you try to help out somebody as best you can. Mm -hmm. You know, you see it happen sometimes with other shops or whatever. They're pushing limits and they're pushing the car at the absolute maximum. Bro, these turbos, you got a 64, 66, that precision rates at, you know, 900 horse. And you got people making over 900 wheel horse. These things are rated at crank horsepower. So they're overspinning the turbocharger. The turbo's on its limit. You know, you get a few, you know, if you get a boost leak at 900 wheel on a, on a 64, 66, it's toast. You're going to overspin the turbo. The bearing cartridge is going to be done. Turbo is never going to be the same. It's going to start smoking. Oh, precision turbo suck. No, it's not the case. You're, you're overspinning the shit out of the turbo to make the power that you're making. Mm. If you take that rating that it's rated at. Yeah. And you then now if you, okay, if you have a um, thousand horsepower turbo. Okay. That. Precision, Garrett, Borg Warner, whoever, rates mm -hmm. at 1,000 horsepower. Depending on the car that you have, you have to subtract your drivetrain loss. Now, your drivetrain loss is going to be, the rule of thumb on most uh, rear-wheel drive cars is 15% on a rear-wheel drive manual car. Okay. Now, rear-wheel drive automatic cars, you had to add 3 to 5% for the torque converter because torque converter takes up power to run. Right. It. Now... So you end up at 20%, let's say, for a rear-wheel drive car. So any, any, any type of um, interference between the motor and the drivetrain? From, is... the, from, the, from the rear snout of the crankshaft, yeah. where you bolt your flywheel or torque converter to, mm -hmm. to, the wheels to, the on wheels. The, to the wheels. So you got, you got your transmission. So you have your torque converter, your clutch. Your clutch is direct. It's, right. a, you know, it's a clutch. That's why right. manual cars have less drivetrain loss. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you have your, if you have a BMW or, you know, most cars these days, you got a Guibo. It's like a little flex this. You're not really losing anything there, mm -hmm. but it's there. It flexes. And then right. what it does is save your drivetrain. Mm. A lot of people take that out and then they're breaking transmissions, breaking drivers, breaking differentials because you took this out. Yeah. Leave that fuse in there because when that, when you take that out, you're, you're making everything else rigid. Your drive shaft, which is normally never any give mm -hmm. your differential, which if it's, you know. Depending on the car that you have, the differential, you're going to have to build it or... So anything from, you know, your axles, everything is going to be a lot, a percentage loss at one. It's going right. to add up to a percentage. Front wheel drive cars, the uh, rule of thumb was about 12%. And the way that they got this is, you know, you have an engine on a um, engine dyno, mm -hmm. which is, you know, set up like on a stand and they run a, a water break to it. And that's how they get, uh, that's how they get the, the, the crank horsepower number because they're yeah. at the crankshaft. And then they put those engines in cars and then ran them on a chassis dyno. And then they got about that rule of thumb. People don't do that anymore because it's so time consuming. Right. You know, to set up an engine on the stand and then throw it in a car and then run it on the dyno again. Who yeah. cares? Yeah. Like, you know, at that point. But um, anyway, all -wheel, uh, front wheel drive cars about 12% manual. And then uh, all wheel drive cars are pretty, depending on the uh, drivetrain, like if it's a front wheel based uh, all wheel drive car, you know, like a transverse engine with, yeah. a, with a transaxle, um, those would be about 15 to 17%. Um, and then the uh, longitudinal ones, they were closer to twenty percent. What do you think a GTR would be at because of how 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 like well you that, that, tra that, that drivetrain is very different. That setup, it, you know how I said a transaxle will have less drivetrain loss. Yeah, um, that car has the transmission in the rear, kind of right. like the Corvette, right? Where you know it it has everything in the back, and then it you know it has the center div, it has the uh, sorry um, the front drive shaft. And, uh, you know, it allows it to split to the front also. Um, I feel like a GTR is probably around the same. Same. Like, fifth, like around that 15 to 18%. Okay. So 15 to 20% yeah. on average across the board. Probably. Both. You know, and the, the, the number kind of gets skewed because right. the other thing you got to think of is that 
Yeah, let's say that's the number at, you know, stock. Right. But now you cranking that you cranking it up. It's like you I don't feel like that exact percentage is going to be the same across the across board. Across the board, yeah. You know, I feel like I there has to be a point where there has to be a point where you have a slope where it's going to change your percentage. Right. You know, that I I don't I feel like if it's let's say if it's 15% on a rural drive car at 500 horsepower. I feel like at a thousand, it might be 12 or 10%. I don't feel like it's going to be, you know, you're driving so much power through it. Ain't nothing given, you know, yeah. there are so many like educational videos on YouTube where you can look this stuff up. There are so many books that, yeah, you know, there's so many books that I use that I, I used in college that, you know, I had to buy that are in PDF on the internet that you can find. Yeah. You know, if you want to, if, if you woke up one day and you're like, you know what, I want to build, I want to build the baddest engines on the planet. But I need to learn about engines first. Right. You can find that information online. You can find like, you know, a real engines book. You can find, you know, stuff. Uh, you can find like a bunch of videos on how to build engines, stuff like that. And you can become good at it. It's not hard. You know, you used to be able to be, you know, people be on B20 VTech.com. Everybody, everybody <laughs> in the tri-state had a login on B20. Yeah, B20. And, you know, and people, you know, we used to go on there. We used to, you know, look at people's stuff or builds and. You know, you you would on other forums like Audi forums. Um, I was on S2KI forums, uh, which is S2000 forum. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there was now it's the uh, Mark V Supra forum, yeah. I think it is. But uh, yeah, that's but the forums it. are you know a lot of forums are kind of dead right now, unless you have like a new chassis or a new car where there's exactly. a lot of enthusiasts. Exactly, the old yeah. ones always die off. Right, but then you have the diehard enthusiast that still has their 20, 30 year old car that they love, and they're yeah. gonna modify it. And they look for a forum post, like they're working on the car and they got a problem. And next thing you know, you're like, damn, like this same guy had a problem 20 years ago on yep. a forum and you find the solution to it. But dude, that's like, that's like the holy grail right there. You're like, man, I'm gonna drink to that, you know? But, um, you know, it's, you have so much more information at your fingertips these days Yeah. where, you know, you have back then you had a lot of tuners that wouldn't share their secrets. Mm -hmm. You know, you had a lot of builders that would never talk about their recipe. Yeah. You know, but these days they tell you like, yo, yeah, I got this turbo. I got this in the engine. You know, I got this in my car. I got this guy. The same guy tunes. Like you look at a top, you look at a top 10 list for most cars that drag race. And it's like the same tuners tuning five or six of them, you know, and the, they're the ones that are succeeding. That's true. That is very true. You know, because tuners, a lot of tuners figured out at the end of the day, like if you stick with one shop, yeah, you can stick with one shop and be extremely successful. Mm -hmm. But if you... If you tend to more shops, if you are, um, you know, if you're helping more shops or you're putting more information out there, you're helping more of a community and you have, you build more of a following like that. Mm -hmm. And the tuner can kind of look out for themselves. A lot of shops would throw tuners under the bus, you know, like perfect example. Joe said, Joe, Joe pretty much said it when you're building a Mustang. He's like, yo, these things you can, they're, they're, you know, you, as long as you build it right. Yeah. The tune is on point. There, there are. BMWs, BMWs, Supras, all these cars. If you use, if most of your factory sensors are in place, it doesn't matter if you build the car and put the biggest turbo ever or the, you know, PI, whatever. If most of your sensors are in place and like the engine was timed correctly and yeah. everything is plugged in right, the car's going to run. Right. It's going to run pretty okay. It might not run perfect. It might not be running good enough for you to beat on it, but you'll be able to drive it out the shop. There should be no reason for you to say, you know, for you to get like a Mustang or something like that and you and you build it and like it was running before you built it and you took it apart, built the engine and put it back in the car. Yeah. And then the shop's telling you, yo, you need a tune. Like this is why your car's not running right. No, your car's not running right because something that was either missed or, you know, or something that kind of got, you know, rushed right. to get done. You know, at the end of the day, I feel like, you know, I feel like it's, yeah, if the shop doesn't do tuning, I understand like, okay, yo. We put a standalone on this car. It needs a tuner. Yes. But if you had a running car that was like, all right, you change a few parts on it. For the most part, if it wasn't like a standalone car, it should run pretty decent on factory computers. Factory computers are extremely smart. Yeah. They do, they do a lot. They do like a good amount of calculations and, you know, they can get the car running pretty decent. But when it comes down to it, a standalone, I, you know, I'm going to support a standalone. Okay. Um, for, for any of those guys that want to push, I feel like, on like an E36 or, you know, an older platform, you know, that want to push past that seven, 800 mark. Mm -hmm. I feel like a standalone is more worth it. You know, you get, you get flex fuel, you get boost by gear, you know, you get that rolling anti-lag, the two step, you know, and at the end of the day, you, you can monitor all your sensors. 
you know, you can, B-58s are different. You know, B-58s and then all the newer cars, anything really after like, I want to say like 2010. Yeah. All the data, like those cars have so many sensors, you can see it all like in an OBD screen. Right. So that's why a lot of these guys still use stock computer and it works great because you can see all the live data, but cars older than that, dude, you know, we were, we're doing chip tunes on BMWs where you can't see anything. <laughs> you're kind of just you know shooting you, you're kind of just shooting in the dark you got your math scaling and you got your you know you got your math in your in your injectors and you got to make sure your fuel pressure's right and then let's try it yeah and you know nine out of ten times jordan would knock it out of the park you know and a lot of other tuners they would they would do very well also right but the car had to be built a certain way you know like if you have a factory if you have a factory computer e36 yeah you have to have the math in the correct location if you're turboing it your blow off valve cannot be too close to your math because what happens at idle, the car makes enough vacuum to open your blow off valve. And now it's disrupting the voltage going, it's disrupting the voltage that it's reading at your math because mm. the math is reading the airflow coming in. If it's reading the airflow coming in through all the pipes and it's just a current of airflow and then the blow off valve opens and now disrupts that airflow, the voltage is going to change. And now the car starts doing weird stuff. Yeah. It starts to idle differently. It starts to buck. It's like, you know, choppy when you're trying to get on the throttle. Right. All things like that happen, but people won't, you know, instead of trying to diagnose it or instead of trying to, you know, figure out what's going wrong, they go, yo, my tune sucks. I need this tuner. No, your tune doesn't suck. Like you just, you know, you, you didn't build the car wrong. Yeah. You just had to change a few things around. You can remedy those things, you know, simply, but that's, you know, that's building a car. So, uh, you have a shop yeah. and you used to work at petrol. That's where you, that's where you probably, most people would know you from because of the amount of time you've spent there mm -hmm. over the years. Yeah. Um, so this car was built in that shop. No, I built this. I had this car during, I had this car during college. Um, and it was all motor. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then one time I, I was going up, I was, you know, talking shit on the forums and they had a, uh, uh, they had like a street racing forum mm -hmm. in the, in the Beamer forums. And like the, a bunch of guys from Yonkers used to, you know, go out there. Yeah. And if any of you guys are familiar with the Yonkers, with the, you know, racing scene in Yonkers, uh, you'd pull up at like, you pull up at the Burger King or at the, uh, at the, uh, at the Dunkin' Donuts, mm -hmm. you know, you get a few cars came out. You would have like, you'd have like a nitrous Maxima come out, bro. Like, yeah, this is like the stuff that you see. But this is back then. <laughs> um, but anyway, a few guys, a few guys that that I'm friends with, that I'm friends with now, uh, you know, they're talking smack on the internet. And um, one guy got an RSX. Mm -hmm. The other guy got a uh, a uh, Midori EG hatch. Beautiful car, beautiful car. But anyway, the the hatch was. Uh, had a B18 swap. I think it was either, a, I think it was a, I think it was a, um, could have been JDM swap. I don't think it was a GSR. I think it was a overseas motor. Mm. Um, and then the RSX, you know, was Bolton K20. Right. I would race these cars on Long Island all day. I would race turbo Integras with my all motor BMW. Okay. Yeah. From a dig. And I would have them to the eighth all day. And then, you know, close race up until the quarter. I would race, you know, H-swapped Integras. Then I would race, um, you know, GSR, EGs, uh, whatever the case is, Hondas. Okay, mm -hmm. I raced Hondas plenty of times in my all-motor BMW, yeah. and I never lost. I never lost. I had, everything was a good run, or everything was like, okay, yeah, that car should have beat me, no right, problem. Right. But you telling me you got all-motor Hondas in Yonkers, and I can't come around these cars. That's crazy. Like I, I'm, I'm coming here and I'm like, all right, let's try it out. So I went up there. I got my butt handed to me the first time. Uh huh. Okay. And then I'm like, damn, that's crazy. Change a few mods. A little more aggressive on the tune. Make a little more jam. Strip the car out. Like I took, oh, I took the seats out the car. I, I made my car a tin can. Yeah. I went back and I got my ass handed to me worse. And they said they didn't change anything. I'm like, bro, there's no way. Okay, there's no way. <laughs> And uh, at the time, I wrote in um, one of my one of my good friends at the time, uh, Scalzi. He he uh, may rest in peace. He passed away a few years ago, God and um, he he had a uh, he he called it the hoopty, okay. And a lot and a lot of guys in the BMW scene that are in the tri state area they remember this car. Scalzi was extremely impressive, okay. Mm -hmm. This man, um, uh, he he was sick when he was a kid, and uh, his legs didn't work. He would drive 
a manual BMW. This is why like I don't really get respect from old from older BMW guys who oh I need a, I need an automatic or whatever, you know, I want to race an automatic. Yeah. Because this man would race a five or six hundred wheel horsepower at the actually it ended up making like eight hundred plus. But he had an E thirty four, which is a like a nineteen ninety five series. Mm-hmm. And it had an S fifty two turbo, um, you know, big old Garrett turbo on there, stock five speed transmission, and he would push his legs down. He would start the race and go like this, and then when he went to shift, he would throw the clutch. He would throw his leg at the clutch and grab the gear. And that man was the that man was so impressive. That was respect. Anyway, wow, I rode in that car. Crazy. I rode in that car, and uh, in Yonkers. Yeah. And bro, he he like there were cars that I used to follow. Like you know this guy, um, he had a supercharged E36. Was making like five hundred at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, There's another guy. Uh, that had a uh, a really nice turbo E30 that was making like the same thing around like 450, 500. Yeah. Um, and you know, a few other cars or whatever and some bikes. Like this guy used to race bikes. He used to race anything I pulled up next to him. And I'm in Yonkers and I'm riding in his car. Bro, I'm recording out the sunroof of his raggedy E34 that he called the Hoopty. Yeah. He's blowing the doors off these cars and he's making like five, six hundred horsepower with a turbo. I'm like, man, I'm never ride, driving my shit on motor again. <laughs> so, bro, after, listen, after I got my butt handed to me and I rode in that car, I was like, I'm turboing my car. And I, I built it in my backyard right in, you know, right in Copeg, Long Island. Yeah. I pulled the engine out. I, you know, I did the, uh, we, I did, we, me and my father, we did the, uh, we did the engine swap originally because I bought it. It was, it was actually the car, this car was going to the scrapyard when mm. I bought it. It was in Pennsylvania. I was on the forums and um, I had another E36 back then, but I always wanted a red four door. Like that's, I, I saw a red four door one time and I never saw one again. And I was like, yo, that's hot. I want a red four door. Right. So I was looking for one and sure enough, one in Pennsylvania, part out, going to the scrapyard, 325i. I'm like, yo, how much for the car? He's like, oh, I sold the headlights and the, I sold the headlights and the bumpers off it. Yeah. I'm like, I'm coming to get it. Yo, how much you want? He said like 800 bucks. Let's go. Went there, go get it, come back. And uh, anyway, me and my dad, we did the swap and everything, and it was all motor. And then I, uh, what I had in there was, like I said, I had an all motor aluminum block. Yeah. But, you know, I know the iron block is stronger. Mm-hmm. And I'm already in college at this point. I'm learning like, yo, the iron's going to be stronger. It's going to take more abuse. Right. So I swap in an iron block. I do a turbo setup. I didn't tune it. I didn't listen to my tuner. And I blew the thing up the first day I drove it. Oh, what? <laughs> Bro, you spend so much time doing it. Yo, first, wait. Not before I call some W's first. Okay. okay, okay. So I went out. I, I, knocked, the, I knocked the doors off a, uh, off a cammed geared LS1 Camaro. Uh-huh. My car was like at 13, 14 pounds. It was probably making like 450 maybe. Yeah, it was like 450, 500 horse yeah. at the time. And uh, I knocked the doors off of uh, for Camaro. And then by that point, the car started smoking a little bit more. I was like, ah, we're going to keep driving this shit. <laughs> and then my other boy, he had just got a, he had just got a 5.0, like Coyote. Like when they first came out, it was like, yeah. a, uh, you know, it was like, like a 14, I think, or a 13. Mm-hmm. I ran him, I ran him like, it must have been like 10 times that night, bro. By the 10th run, like he had, he was, he was like, coming by me and the car was just smoking like a sieve at that point i said man i gotta i gotta park this up and i drove it home and it was just smoking like crazy i was like man i, I gotta pull it i gotta pull the head yeah so uh, the next day in my in in the street in mm-hmm. front of my house i you know i pulled the cylinder head off the car and i look at the pistons three pistons are broken i'm like well actually i'm sorry five pistons were broken five okay car drove home car drove home it boosted it just smoked like crazy wow but it drove home. It was just, you know, thing was cruising. Yeah. And um, I threw a stock block in it, 2.5, and I put my turbo kit, same turbo kit I made, everything, put it on. It was all custom. They don't they don't sell turbo kits for these cars. They still don't to this day for the E36? You can get like a hot parts kit. They don't really have like a full kit. You okay. kind of got to piece everything together. And some some guys have tried to piece a kit, kit together over the years, mm-hmm. but the market's just not there. You know, so a lot of people, they really want something tailored to their car. Right. And depending on the turbo that you go with or, you know, like the downpipe size you want, at the end of the day, it's really just all a custom build. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I built it in my I built it in my front yard and then I enjoyed that. I used to daily that to school. I was making like 500. I tuned it that time. 500 is nice. Dude, this. I was enjoying it. It was on, I, I built it to run on 85. So okay. my car ran on 85. Now what year was this that you were doing that? 
2011. Okay. Maybe. 2011. I think it was, I think it was like 2011. Um, anyways, you know, I was driving into school, dailing it. And, uh, then I started to get crazy. Then I'm like, all right, this thing's spinning too much. I need bigger tires. All yeah. right. Now I start doing the flares, you know, now the car is wider. Okay. It's hooking better. All right. Now I need more jam. And it's still kind of lazy. I had a two five. I was like, I had a two eight that I got for like, like 150 bucks at the time. These engines <laughs> are no longer that cheap. And you know, like they got two J tax. Yeah. These, these things now they got E36 tax. That's mm -hmm. it. They went up like crazy. So um, anyway, I bought that block for like 150 bucks. I was like, all right, I cleaned it up. I changed the rings on it. I changed like the rings and the bearings and I did everything in my backyard. Um, I bought a different turbo manifold that went top mount because they used to be bottom mount, mm -hmm. which uh, bottom mount is the turbo mounted um, below the cylinder head. Uh, top mount is the turbo mounted above the cylinder head, which, you know, you spend all this money on a car. You want to, you want to pop the hood and you want to, yo, that's my turbo right there. <laughs> you know, you don't, like I said before, you don't go to the gym to yeah, look smaller. To look smaller. Yeah, yeah. In your stomach, but you don't go to the gym for your arms to look small. You feel me? So, that's you know, true. that's, that's it. And, um, you know, you enjoy, uh, you know, you enjoy showing off your car and right. that was it. I built that car. I built that car in my backyard and then I, I prided myself on being able to do that and compete, you know, with guys that had their cars built at shops. Yeah. You know, so like I could, you know, there are people that think like there are some guys that think that I come at them because I have a shop and they do stuff from their backyard. But mm -hmm. I could never knock that, yeah. you know, because I came from that and I respect it, you know, but sometimes, you know, respect is a two way street. But sometimes they don't, you know, they don't show the respect because they think I'm some guy that has a shop and I think I'm better than everybody else. I don't. I work on E36. I don't think I'm better than everybody else. Right. You know, at the end of the day, you know, I just I, I opened up a shop to, you know to do what i love right and that's it but yeah no i built it there and uh i started built it at the house and then it used to make like seven it was like seven eight hundred wheel and uh backyard built 700 wheel e36 yeah dude stock training stock diff it was all on borrowed time you know <laughs> it, like i built the diff and everything but it was still stock size diff which is uh it was 188 millimeter ring gear which okay. is like seven it's like seven and a quarter Okay. It's like something like that. It's like a little over seven inches in diameter. Mm -hmm. um, like you have a, if you have a 48.8, that's your ring gear diameter. Right. So like the larger the ring gear, the stronger it is. Um, so like, you know, a BMW 188 millimeter diff is like good to seven, 800 horsepower. Okay. Like that's like the absolute limit. Right. Um, if it's built, you got to build, you got to do the clutches in it. Sometimes you got to, you know, get the gears polished or whatever. Right. And uh, I had an upgraded diff. I had all that. I had, I had fun, bro. I would go to the track. I would go to Poconos, which, you know, I went to roll racing because I didn't want to break the car every time I drove it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I had fun. I beat up on cars that were built at, at shops and they spent way more money than me. And I'm here. I'll never forget, bro. There was one race. I'm at Poconos and this was during Impact. Um, I, it was my first time ever at Impact. And it was like my first time ever racing at a track. Yeah. And... I brought my car and, you know, my, my, my dad who has always, always supported me, um, it, you know, he, he, he helped me out. We, we got the car on the trailer and, you know, we went up to the, we went up to the track. Um, we get there, we pull the car off the trailer and people are looking at my build and it's like, all right, you know, I, I had a whole set turbo and, you know, I had like a Home Depot dryer duct intake, you know, it was, yeah, yeah. It was like real, you know, backyard stuff. It, it looked it looked a little raggedy, you know, back then I wasn't, you know, I didn't have like the style that I got now, but, right, right. um, you know, I was proud of my, I was proud of my raggedy built car. It was, you know, that was my thing. There was a, right next to me, there was a shop. There was a shop that had, they had like eight or nine techs there that day. Mm -hmm. And they had like two or three cars. And I'm not going to say the name of the shop, but they had a 911 turbo. Um, it was a, it was a 997. Okay. And it was, uh, you know, it was a bolt-on car. They had like race gas in it. It was a PDK, you know, so it was, right. um, you know, with the paddle shifters. And there's a problem. There's a, there's a problem with that event. And the problem is that it's, they, the, the way the cars are staged and the, the way you're waiting to go run yeah. at that event at the Poconos. There's, there's a few different events that are ran at the Poconos. That event in particular, um, they kind of oversell tickets and you know like it's a it's a great event right it's a it's a wonderful car show and i'll never i'll never knock the car show but for the racing it's 
it's not as it's not as controlled. It's okay. not as regulated. Right. And what ends up happening is you have everybody sitting in staging for an hour, hour and a half. These cars are getting crazy hot. Yeah. Anyway, we go out, do a bunch of runs. I'm I'm kicking I'm kicking butt. Okay. I I there was a E36 that was making like 100 wheel horsepower more than me. It was a it was a built it was a better built motor than mine. You know, it had like a three two. You know, mine was a two eight. Mine was revving higher, but whatever. Mm. That one had more torque. And, um, you know, I had a whole set $500 turbo from eBay that was used from a Cummins. These guys had, you know, Garrett GTX. Actually, at the time, I think it was HTA was like the best you can get, which was like a yeah. force performance Garrett. Um, they had the best of the best. And, you know, I put lengths on them. Then comes the, you know, Mark IV Super that was making like seven, seven, eight hundred wheel horsepower at mm -hmm. the time. My car was making six, six fifty. Gave him a run. You know, then I raced the supercharged Mustang. I was making like 700 wheel. I gave him a run, you know, like I'm in front of, I'm in, when I say give him a run, it's a close race, but I have him by like a car, car and a half. It's not like yeah. I walked him, right. but it's like I have him by like a car, car and a half from a 60 to like 150, one, whatever. Right. And these, and I, every, I keep coming back to the pits at Poconos. Next to me is the shop. And bro, the, the owner of the car, like the owner of the car is a customer. Yeah. The owner of the car is coming over me. Nice guy. He's like, yo, that thing is awesome. You know, what do you have in it? Blah, blah, blah. How much power does it make? And I'm like, oh, you know, what's going on with your car? He's like, I see, you know, you guys got all the mechanics on it. Is something breaking? He's like, no, we're just trying to figure out why it's not going so fast, why it's not going fast enough. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you know, like, you know, no offense, but, you know, your car is like, you know, backyard built and you're doing better numbers than me. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And you know what's crazy is like, yeah. I'll bet you I'll make your car go faster right now. I'm like, turn the car off. I was like, shut the car off and let just let it chill for 40, 50 minutes, bro. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yo, you're sitting in staging for like an hour, hour and a half. Car's getting crazy hot. It's a 95, 100 degree day already. Yeah. I was like, these cars are pulling, these cars are pulling timing. The transmission's getting crazy hot. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not running at its optimum. Right. And, you know, you have a car where the engine's in the back. You're not having the best airflow to it either that's true you know yeah. yeah they're built like that and they're you know they have good cooling that helps it out and everything but at the end of the day bro if you got the turbos in the back and you, versus the turbo in the front turbo in the front is going to get the air first right and it's going to get the cooler air first yeah. the inner the inner cooler is going to be cooler mm -hmm. you know it's all going to work and i was like shut the car off for an hour wait for the staging lanes to clear out a little bit and go out for a run he went out and did that and he went four mile an hour faster and all and none of the techs that were there could have told him that like you have the owner of a big shop this shop is still big today. They're not in the tri-state. Yeah. But this shop is still big today. You have all you have a bunch of texts. You have the tuner on the laptop. Every every run plugging in. When you see that, it just drives me to want to it just drives me to want to be them more. Like if I see you plugging into your car after every single run, I I'm just I'm going to I'm going to knock the brakes off your car. And it's like really? and I'm not I'm not plugging into the car. I used to do, that was my thing with stock computer. That's why I kept pushing stock computer so much. Mm -hmm. Is because I was like, "Yo, you know what?" This tune is math based. I can drive it around twelve pounds of boost, and it's yeah. the same exact tune for fifty pounds of boost. Right. I just I just hit the boost controller, mm. so it looks like I didn't change anything. I'm driving the car. Al Alan, a a yeah. money's way. He'll tell <laughs> you that. He'll tell you that when we race, I turn the boost up. I didn't. Okay. I actually just hit the brake boost on him, which was okay. like you know I I break, which you know you hit the brakes, you give it gas at the same time when right. you're in gear ready to race, and it'll spool up the car and you'll take off much better. Which you know, big, you know, obviously uh, big engine guys don't really have to worry about that or supercharger guys don't have to worry about that. But if mm -hmm. you have a big turbo on a small engine, you need yeah. every, you need all the help you can get. But, um, yeah, I would, you know, I was just ready to run. I was, I was like, yo, let's turn it up. Let's just hit the boost controller. And that was always my problem. I'd hit the boost controller until I blew it up. <laughs> I found the limits. I was like, yo, stock engine, 700 wheel. Okay. I'm, I'm not giving that to a customer because yo, one misfire, um, you know, an injector gets clogged. Yeah. Plug goes bad. Sensor starts reading wrong. You can pop it on one hit. Mm -hmm. You don't want that to happen. If you have a five, if you, if it's built for a thousand and you're driving around at 800 all day and you have like a miss here and there, you can figure it out. You can fix it in nine out of 10 times. It'll be okay. Yeah. But if you're driving it on the ragged edge, it's any, when something goes, when the smallest thing goes wrong at that point, yeah. That's pull it. the engine out. Pull the engine That's out. That's it, bro. So with these E36s, right? Uh, there's a we have mar he's a, a co-host on the podcast mm -hmm. he has one really nice one white clean um just redid it and he wants to put a turbo in his car okay. so for people with these cars right what do you recommend if they want to make anywhere from five to let's say 700 horsepower um 
Something that, that's like fun on the street, rear wheel drive. Of course. Fun, fun in these cars, you're gonna be at that five, 600 horsepower range. When mm -hmm. you hit that seven, that's where the training is unreliable, the diff's unreliable. Okay. Um, the other thing also is that the clutch, you know, it starts to get more pricey. For you to make 600. On, on a what car? On the E36, E36. on an M3 or right. 325, 328. For you to make 600 wheel, um, it's gonna cost you the same as it's gonna cost you for 400 wheel. You know, because the cars never came turbo from factory, so you need a turbocharger. Mm -hmm. you, need an, you need a tune with injectors. You know, if you go stock computer, um, you know, you need a stock computer tune. You need, um, you know, the math sensor that comes with that tune. The entire package is a good amount of money. Right. But the tune is the same for that four to 600 horsepower. Okay. So now the other thing that you have to do is because the compression is higher from factory, you got to do, you got to pull the head off. You got to do a copper spacer to drop the compression. Ah, because it gives you more space. It gives you, you add there. more space to the, you right. add more volume to the combustion chamber. Okay. Well, to the, yeah, to the combustion chamber. And what ends up happening is that it's safer on pump gas. You cannot do that. And, um, you cannot do that and change the head and install head studs without removing the cylinder head. Mm -hmm. You can do head studs on these engines one by one, but you have to pull the cams out. But okay. anyway, you can install head studs and then make 500 wheel horsepower on E85 stock engine. That's no problem. You can make 650, 700 wheel horsepower stock engine. People okay. have done it, you know, and it's in those cars live sometimes. Right. But, um, to do that, you have to do all those things. You have to do the copper spacer. You know, you end up having to overbuild your fuel system. You need like a really large exhaust downpipe setup. Okay. Um, these cars are notorious for choking on a three inch exhaust or in three inch downpipe also. Really? Yeah. So what, what do you recommend? Like a three um, and a half, well, four it inch? Well, it depends on the power level also. I'm okay. saying they choke at like six to 650 wheel. Gotcha. If you're recirculating the wastegate. Okay. You know, turbo cars, you have a wastegate to control the boost. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some internally gated turbos like factory turbo cars, they have a pretty large downpipe and exhaust from factory because the extra exhaust flow that you're venting to control the boost is still in the downpipe and in the exhaust. Mm. On, a lot of, on a lot of cars where people turbo them after the fact that they never came turbo or they upgrading stuff, they do, um, you know, an external wastegate. Right. Where you can recirculate that also. It's quieter. Yeah. You know, you're not bothering, you know, the grandmas around town. But, right. Um, what ends up happening is that now you're restricting flow. Right. If you, if, yeah, if a three inch true. pipe is, if a three inch pipe with no wastegate recirculating flow into, going it, into it, it yeah. is good for 600, 650, the, if you're recirculating it, now you've got to chop like 50 or 60 horsepower off at that point yeah because of the back because of the because back of the back pressure right. it's slowing down the turbo itself because it's not the turbo can't spin up as much as fast as it can and then you know sometimes you lose spool and stuff like that so like you know when you're building a turbo car these are all things that you know all that information is out there now but back yeah. then that information wasn't wasn't readily available yeah you used to read you know we would read magazines where they're doing tests like yo we vented the waste can and it picked up 50 wheel and you're like mm -hmm. all right why is that and you look into why they did it and i'm i'm sitting here i'm paying Eleven ninety nine a subscription, you know, a month for a subscription to Sport Compact Car or Super <laughs> Street, you know. And I'm yeah. reading these cars, where I'm like, "Yo, all right, this is cool," and I'm learning a lot about it. And that's where the passion came from, mm. you know. But yeah, if you want to turbo one of these cars, you know, for that power level, stock computer tune is fine. Um, you know, I would do a head gasket and a spacer. But the other problem is like these engines are old. You yeah, know? that's another issue. You're, well, you yeah. know, you're taking a car that's twenty, twenty five years old, actually. At minimum, all these cars are 25 years old now because, you know, the last year that they made them was 99. So yeah. if you bought a 99, if you're lucky enough to get a 99, bro, you have the newest E36 out there and it's still 25 years old. You're right, right, right. Dude, right. you know, so the engine is going to have to go gone. It's going to have to be gone through. You know, like you got to, you got to do, uh, you got to weld the oil pump nut. On the S52s, they have a problem where the oil pump is chain driven off the crankshaft. Okay. And not like a, you know, not like a 2J. Like a 2J, it's right on the snout. A lot of cars that rev high and don't have a problem revving high, the oil pump is right on the snout because it's not an, and it's not an additional um, harmonics issue. Okay. So BMWs have harmonic issues or at high RPM. And if you have an M3, like you said, you're, you said he has an M3, right? Who? Your co-host. You said he has an M3. Yeah, he has an M3. Yes. So the M3 has that harmonics issue because it's the longer stroke. Gotcha. So you have to, on that engine, you have to drop the oil pan, you have to weld the oil pump nut or safety wire it. Either harmonics, way. you mean like what, what, vibrations or? Yes. Okay. Harmonics are vibrations in the engine. Gotcha. Um, and, at, you know, when you're building a high RPM engine, especially a six cylinder, the crankshaft is so long 
that these things at you know when they're st- when they're sitting on a table they look they they look like it's not it, it ain't doing nothing yeah it's fine that's sh- that thing's strong it's not gonna bend but at eight thousand rpm it's like a noodle it's mm. flexing and when it flexes it's creating a harmonics and what ends up happening is that it sends a vibration through the oil pump through the chain that goes to the oil pump and yeah. then through the oil pump and it'll either break the oil pump off sorry break the uh the shaft of the oil pump off or it'll uh, it'll back the nut off what ends up happening is that it backs the nut off okay and even though it's reverse threaded it's it backs the nut off and then once you lose that you lose oil pressure you don't see it until it's too late you know like you get a dummy light on the cluster that's like and it, you'll still be able to drive with it like that too yeah so you got to be careful with that you do that you know i would take the head off and i would send the head to the machine shop okay i would just you know cut the factory valves um deck the head make sure it's flat because a lot of these heads crack um you know the aluminum that bmw was using at the time was a very very bad casting oh that's another thing too that that people don't really i think think about when it comes to building that is like the casting of the blocks that were made back then yes you yeah. have well you know the good thing about then is that the blocks were aluminum well we got blessed in the united states mm-hmm. you know a lot of people say yo the u.s got nerfed and the reason u.s got nerfed is because the u.s's e36 m3 is not a real m3 Okay. And that's BS. The reason they say that is because in Europe and Canada and Japan, Japan, great. <laughs> um, they got the uh, Euro S50 B32, which is, it's like a little, t- it's pretty much like an S54. Okay. Okay. So um, it has, you know, dual vanos. It's a 3.2 liter and it revs higher, has individual throttle bodies. Mm-hmm. Everything else on the car is the same. Okay, you still get the bigger brakes. You still get the nicer bumpers, the nicer interior. Right. You know, you get like a spoiler here. You get different headlights, whatever. The only thing that you have different is the engine. And yeah, I get it. But these engines are better for turbo. The other thing also is that the non-M versions in um, Europe overseas. And, and, and everywhere overseas, they were, um, they were aluminum block. So those guys, they go to turbo and M52 and it's an aluminum block engine, they're done at 450, 500 horsepower. They're ripping the threads out of the cylinder head. Wow. Out of the block for the cylinder right. head. They're, they're done. And, you know, these engines are much better for, you know, for, for turbo. I've always said ITBs on a turbo car, individual throttle bodies on a turbo car is, is stupid. People do it all the time. And what about you, the Skylines, though? Like the, R30, uh, the R33s. Uh, yeah, our, uh, RB26, they RB26, come with that. RB26, yeah. I've always said it's a restriction. You get immediate throttle response, but on a turbo car, it's a restriction. Mm. You know, I'm maybe on a, you know, I'm sure on a factory twin turbo car, it's not a restriction. But when you have a 7, 800 wheel horsepower turbo that you're bolting on your engine and you're forcing the air through a plenum and then that plenum is then distributing the air into six smaller throttle bodies. Yeah. It's hitting a restriction right before, it's hitting a disturbance of air and a restriction right before it hits your combustion chamber. Me, personally, I've always seen better results with a larger throttle body. Like, you put a bigger throttle body and delete the ITBs on S54s. Yeah. So, like, you know, you can call it, you can call it, what it, you can call it, you know, preference, or you can say the U.S. got nerfed. I'm going to call it what it is. ITBs suck. Individual throttle bodies suck. For turbo cars. For turbo cars, yeah. Okay. All motor cars, you guys can have fun. Blah, blah, blah. Great. But turbo cars, I feel like individual throttle bodies, you either just want to flex or, you, you know... Or you're just, you know, you're following, I feel like you're following the wrong mantra at that point. So, okay. So, so we're pretty much clear on, I guess, if you want to make five or 600 horsepower. If you want to make five or 600 horsepower, you get like a, you know, small turbo, like a GT35 or like a 6266. After, after changing out the. the, Oh uh, yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. To the engine, you have to do the copper spacer. Right. Cut ring head gasket, ARP headsets, which is a big problem with the cut ring head gaskets, but you know, I'll we'll leave that for another mm-hmm. time. And uh, you gotta weld the oil pump nut on the S52s. Okay. Um and then you keep the torque around five hundred wheel torque, that thing will live forever. It'll make like six hundred wheel horse. Really? On eighty five, yeah. On eighty five. Damn. Yeah. I might have to I might have to get me one of these. Add barely any boost too. If you if you do it if you keep it ten to one and uh and you just do the ARP headsets with the cut ring head gasket. On like a fresh motor, like if the bottom the bottom end could have two hundred thousand miles on it. These yeah. engines, they they you take them apart, rods look good, rings look good, the bearings look great. You don't have to touch anything in these bottom ends because they're aluminum. Sorry, you don't have to touch iron. anything on these engines right. because they're iron. Right. You know they're very rigid. You can you can think like a piece of steel is not going to flex. 
but a piece of aluminum has way more give to it. Right. At eight, like I said about the crankshaft, at yeah. 8,000 RPM, that blocks it. That block is flexing. And, you know, all that, all that will, you know, matter on longevity. That's why yeah. I feel like, you know, if you want an engine that's going to last for a long time, if you want like a car that you drive, you know, you're going to daily every single day yeah. and you're going to drive. So it's three, 400,000 miles, whatever. Why do you think diesels last so long? They're all iron. They're all iron engines. Yeah. You know, I mean, there might, there are probably some aluminum ones now. I don't want to sound like a boomer. <laughs> probably with the- I don't want to sound like a boomer, but <laughs> you know, I feel like iron's the way to go. And you know, those things are going to last for a long time. You know, I have, you know, I have a Ram, I have a Ram 1500, got the thing new in 2016 and it has like 230,000 miles on it. I've never touched the thing. It has, it has got an oil changes. I've never done a thermostat or a water pump on the damn thing. Like <laughs> what? I probably just cursed myself, you know, but I probably just jinxed myself. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, I hope, um, no, hope not, man. Yeah. But anyway, you know, like those things are going to work. It's a, it's a workhorse. Yeah. But then you get an F-150 truck and yeah, they're fun and you see people racing them and they're sick. Right. But they got nothing but problems, bro. That 10-speed transmission that Ford made, nothing but problems. Bro, they're like, yo, if you keep it under eight, bro, if you gotta if you gotta spend XYZ money and keep it under a certain power to keep that yeah. transmission and safe, then it's toast. Right. You know, have Chris Miller build your training for a Supra. Beat the hell out of it as long as you take care of it right. It's right. gonna work. Yeah. You know, you spent all this money to build the transmission. If I'm spending six, seven grand to build a freaking 10 R80, yeah, and the thing slips after a season and I'm not even kicking it with all the power. Bro, what the hell? Yeah, it's not. You know, they got to figure that out. The six R eighty seems to be much better, but you know that tranny. You know, once they figure that out, those cars are gonna be even way. You know, they're (laughs) even they're already fast. They're gonna be even faster. But um, the uh, you know, I have that's another build I got. You know, I got a uh, my my Ram pickup. I have a turbo kit for that, Mm. and I have a six four. You know, Hemi Apache that I'm throwing in the thing like three ninety two. You know, I'm I'm building that and that's going in. But that's something because I daily that I drive that every single day. Right. Like that has that's my that's my bread and butter. You know, like I gotta go I go to the machine shop with that thing. Uh, you know, I gotta pick up cars. Uh, you know, I'll go. You know, I'll tow everywhere wherever I gotta go. So, so you gotta pick up parts or whatever the case is. Yeah, I drive that every single day. I probably put I probably put twenty thousand miles a year on my truck, and it's iron. You yeah. think if I had a Hyundai, it's gonna do that, bro? It, you know those cars are they throw right. away cars you know at that point it's like if you want something that's going to last i feel like you guys something with iron right and that's going to last you for a long time so how similar are these motors to the um our 2j because it has a very similar design it looks it uh it looks pretty identical uh, you probably can't see it on the cameras but i got a table with a uh <laughs> i, I got a ta- wide yeah you can see it here i got a table with the uh with the bmw engine on it and um the block looks very similar. So the and it also sounds because based on your videos that, that, I've, that I've seen, it yeah, sounds they, pretty similar. They to sound a 2J. they sound pretty similar when they're cam. They sound right. pretty similar. Um, factory cams they sound a little different, but uh, the engines the engines actually very very similar. Uh, the block length itself, a two J is about an inch longer, so you're gonna get more you're gonna get more rigidity after that, and then the block is much more dense. So these these are longer than a two J. No no no, the two J is about longer. an inch longer. Okay. Um, so that's that's inherently going to be stronger. Okay. Um, because it has more material. You know, it's like, you know, if you got a punching bag, mm-hmm. you know, and the punching bag is a hundred pounds, and then you hit that, and then you hit a two hundred pound punching bag. Like right. One one is going to take that hit much better than the other one, and you know these are these make very good power. The thing is though is that these engines. From fact, if you had an all mo which nobody cares if you have an all motor 2J, nobody cares. Yeah. But if you had a built all motor 2J with a factory porting on the cylinder head, but it has cams and stuff, right? It's making like 212 wheel. Okay. Like that's that's it. Okay. But if you had factory porting on one of these and it was built and it was all motor, you can make 270, 280 wheel because the head flows that good. So so the head flows better on on the on the um the M52. on the BMW engine. Yeah, M52 okay. which the on the U all the US E36 is the Do you have like CFM numbers or Uh there's there's numbers out there. Okay. And you know you I'm can just saying off you know off the top of your No, head. off the top I don't know. Okay. I you know I got I got too much information <laughs> up here. I can't keep that in there too. But <laughs> That's like yeah, that's like super nitpicky. Um, no, I It'd be I, cool to know. I I I'm sure we can look it up and we can like, yeah, edit I'll look it. It up. I can point like this and you can probably put it in here, but um, I'll put it up on the, <laughs> if I do find it, because I'm curious. I'm um, curious. But the, the head flow is very good and f- stock porting for stock porting. These engines with, 
the, these engines with the same turbo versus whatever turbo you put on 2J will make more power pound for pound. They wow. always do that. And that was, you know, for a long time, you'd have a 2J with a, if you had a two, and this was during Garrett turbo times mm -hmm. when everybody ran a Garrett and precisions right. were just copies of Garrett's. Um, That's funny. I remember that. Oh it's, man. People, a lot of people don't know that in the end. A lot of people don't know that now, you know, people coming up into yeah, the industry now, yeah. but if you didn't know and pfft, Precision might sue me for this, but <laughs> uh, they would. They used to buy, they used to buy cores from Garrett. They used to buy turbochargers from Garrett, and then modify the compressor wheel and get better performance from the wheels. And they were building better turbos than Garrett. And then Garrett saw, and Caught then they on. started sending them bad turbos, and now Precisions would blow up left and right. Ooh. You know, so like. And then also, you know, like they had to find their way. They had to, you know, they had to, you know, they, they had to get their engineers. They had to, you know, make right. their turbos. They had, they had to find a way. Now they're, you know, one of the leaders in competition. Mm -hmm. But um, for sorry, a while. Sorry, a little off topic. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, a little off topic. But uh, that was, that's interesting, though. I didn't even I didn't even know that. But back then, anyway, for with a Garrett. Yeah. If you had like a, if you had a 2J that was making whatever, if you had a 2J with like a 35R on it, yeah. it was like a 500 wheel horsepower car. A GT35R, Yeah, right? a GT35R yeah. on it. It was a 500 wheel horsepower car, but if you had that same turbo on an M52 or, or S52, mm -hmm. it was a 600 wheel horsepower car. Wow. And they had less boost because the, you know. Because the head, you said the, the head, head flows, flows better. better. When the head flows, boost is just a measure of restriction. Boost is just a measure That's of restriction. That's all it is. Bo what you're measuring when you measure boost is how much boost is not going through the engine. You understand? Because it's stopped at the intake manifold or at the throttle, you know, at the plenum. Right. So all you're measuring is how much air is not going into the engine. That's what boost is. If, you know, unpopular take, you guys can hate me whatever you want, but that's all it is. So when you have, if you have a car that, yo, these things hit 60, 70 pounds of boost all day. Okay. All you're saying is that the head flow sucks. You know, you're trying to cram 70, 80 pounds through an engine that is not trying to take it. Yeah. And now the reason that, you know, perfect, perfect example is, uh, is a 4G63 versus like a, a Honda motor. Okay. Okay. Same turbo pound for pound. You're going to make, you're going to make, okay, let, I'm just going to use round numbers on a 64, 66 at like 35 pounds on a, you know, on a, on a Bill K series yeah. or whatever you do like, okay, let's say you do 800 wheel. Okay. For you to get 800 wheel out of a 4G63 on a 64, 66, it's like 40, 45 pounds of boost. It is a big difference. Right. And b the reason for that is because the head doesn't flow as good. Mm -hmm. You have to just force that much more air into it. And you know, it's fine, but that you have an engine that was designed to be all motor and nine out of 10 times, those engines will perform better with boost than, engines that come already boosted from factory perfect yeah. example is like a coyote yeah you i know, was gonna say the heads flow crazy they flow amazing yeah. why you have a five liter engine that's making you know right pretty much 100 horsepower per liter right right right. you know right. and when you have that you strap some turbos on it these things are flowing like crazy so why doesn't every every company make uh high flow heads because you know you got men you have the cars were not they're meant to be road cars you know yeah. they're not meant to be every car is not meant to be a race car Right, right. Yeah, you can buy a race car. You can buy, you know, you can buy a, a McLaren. You can buy a Lamborghini. You can mm -hmm. buy all these things that were designed to be that. Yeah. But, you know, most of us regular guys, we got cars that, you know, you bought, you know, you're looking at a shitbox on Marketplace. You're like, I'm building that. Next thing you know, you have, you know, you buy a plethora of parts and you're putting something together. When it comes down to it, it's like, it's really just the manufacturer. Right. If you have a manufacturer, perfect example. The reason that I've always loved BMW is because they have racing heritage. You know, BMW raced in motorsport. They raced in rally. They raced in Formula One. You know, they have racing heritage, and that heritage will trickle down into their road cars. Right. But you have manufacturers that, you know, they never did that. Honda has racing pedigree. And people who don't respect Hondas, you know, they, you, have to, you have to understand something. There is a lot of engineering that goes into those engines, and they work very well. Right. But you got to remember, Honda designed, Honda makes Formula One racing engines. You know, for they have a lot of, they have a lot of history yeah. racing. You have, you know, other, going back to BMW. Yeah. You have the McLaren F1, which is an iconic, an iconic supercar. Right. They went to BMW for an engine. 
Yeah. They went to BMW. They're like, I need an engine for this. And what did they do? They took a road engine from, you know, they took a road going V12. Mm-hmm. You know, let's put some nasty heads on this thing and make it flow. And guess what? I think it was like 205 mile an hour back then or something like that. Dude, uh, that car was always oh like. Oh my God. Whenever poster. you played, need, you know, you played yeah. Need for Speed or whatever, that was the car you picked. You picked a McLaren F1. Yep. Like that was it. Yep. And, you know, that was, BMW has so much racing heritage that I've always loved, you know, you, you, you like that. You go to, you know, you go to an event yeah. and there's a lot of enthusiasts that are like, yo, you know, this is cool. That's cool. I went to Lime Rock this year and uh, I went for, a, it was like a historical race. Um, you know, they have like a bunch of events during the year and they do a, uh, they do a car corral where mm-hmm. if you go in the car show, it's like 40 bucks, whatever mm-hmm. you have to pay for parking anyway. The parking is like $30. So, okay. For an extra $10, you mean I get to drive on the track yeah. and take pictures and stuff? Hell yeah. I'm gonna do that. <laughs> so, you know, you go up to Lime Rock. It was like a three, it was like a three and a half hour drive. Um, you know, me and my fiance, we hopped in the car four in the morning, drove up to Lime Rock. Drove this car like you see it right now, mm-hmm. you know, thousand wheel horsepower, all wheel drive, manual. I made it a daily, okay? Car, I can daily it if I wanted to. Yeah. Drove it up to Lime Rock, get to the track. People are like, yo, that's so sick, whatever, blah, blah, talking to me. And a lot of them are BMW enthusiasts, older dudes, you know, guys that, you know, they've been looking at this stuff since, you know, 60s, 70s, and they see all the racing pedigree. Mm-hmm. You know, you go to, uh, you go to Chevrolet, they've been racing forever. You know, you buy a Corvette, there's, there's pedigree in that car. There's, right. there's his, there's history, heritage though, yeah. in that car. And then you go, you have a bunch of Corvette, you know, enthusiasts that they're wearing their, you know, new, they're wearing the new balance and their jorts. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, like, I like, I like being a car enthusiast and I like the brand because of that. A lot of, a lot of brands have that. And a lot of brands that have the heritage have, you know, they have good they have good flowing engines they have right. that stuff comes down to the engines you have ford ford race ford racing is a thing mm-hmm. they have excellent flowing engines you have audi audi does audi audi volkswagen they have a lot of engines for years people are people are you know going crazy for the daza mm-hmm. audi's had five cylinders for years and they work amazingly well yeah, yeah the daza is great it's really really great good power band the transmissions are great like those cars work very well yeah um but you know you have the vr6 the vr6 is a legendary engine my dad had a red one a dude red vr6, VR6 uh, legendary Passat, engine. And, yeah 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 that's the they they if you had a 12 valve vr6 bro that thing you build it you throw a turbo at it yeah. iron block the thing takes so much boost <laughs> bro you can make seven eight hundred wheel horsepower with like a relatively simple build vr6 and the problem that you would have is the transmission is going to break because not Audi didn't make anything at the time that was really going to handle it. Yeah. You know, you had group five, you had the uh, group five rally cars or group B, I forget which one it was with the Audis where mm-hmm. these cars were making like 850, 900 horsepower on dirt in the eighties, yeah. eighties and eighties or nineties. But you know, this is like racing heritage and yeah. all that comes down into the cars that you're driving, mm-hmm. you know, and, and see, and like going to go, going to an event or, you know, or being in a community that has that. You you experience it from different levels. You enjoy it. I I love racing. I love drag racing. It's great. And you go to the track, you have an awesome time. But sometimes the egos get so big. Yeah. And you know, you kind of want to, you know, you you kind of want to just like take a step back and, you know, see things a little differently sometimes. No, I it's crazy. Dude, it's funny because like I'm not really talking that much this episode, but it's just like this is so much information and it's so cool to I actually bet, dude. I most, no but it's good <laughs> it's good information when we were speaking earlier dude and you were saying all this stuff i'm like yo we got to talk about that because <laughs> i'm so i like to know like the history i of like why. to be really technical yeah so like I, you I know love, and that's I the thing technical. like i i I'm, I'm always learning yeah you know i always try to learn i'm always trying to read something or mm-hmm. you know trying to you know always look to the new thing and the yeah, reason yeah. for that is because um you know the day you think you know everything is the day you stop learning but anyway, I, I built this car, you know, I built this car in my backyard and, it, you know, it made good jam and I've always had fun with it. And then when I started working over there with, uh, you know, with those guys, uh, Mo and his team, and, you know, as part of that team, I, I did I did change things on the car and, you know, it did get better. It advanced like everything mm-hmm. else is going to get better with time. You know, I, I did change some things and I, I learned some things, which is great. You know, yeah. it's and that's the thing is like you always got to be learning because you know, and this is something that comes now for with the times. 
I always look at different builds yeah. to try to, you know, to try to see like, okay, what are these guys doing and apply it to here? Different platforms. Because, right. you know, different platforms have different things going on that is working really well for them. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you can extract everything, like perfect example, you can look at a Honda engine and people could, like I said, people don't, some people don't respect them. Yeah. You look at a Honda engine and, you know, they're extracting every bit of horsepower from those things. And look at how they're doing that and apply that to a different engine. And you're going to see great things happen. Yeah. You know, you're going to be like, all right, well, look, this engine, they're doing this. They're doing an aluminum rod. Okay. They're revving it to here. They got CNC ported heads. You know, this is something, you know, this is crazy. Right. And you add that to a different engine. And what are you going to see? You're going to see results. You know, you had, you had, um, BMW, like perfect example, uh, BMWs, they, they had port injection. So like you would have to hit it with a lot of meth, you know, to run, you know, to, to have the fueling to run E85. Yeah. And, uh, you know, on Corvettes, same thing, like the LT4 Corvette, same thing. You got to hit it with a lot of meth to make like those big numbers. You got to do a cam for the Mm -hmm. high pressure and then hit it with a lot of meth to make that power. Right. And bro, you apply some of you, you move some of that stuff around and you apply some of that knowledge in different areas and you're going to get some good results, but some stuff don't, not everything works. You know, you're going to find out what works and what doesn't, but you know, you're going, you have to learn it. So over the years of, of of being there, you were able to kind of do a lot of research. Yeah. You know, cause when I, when, when I worked there and, I'm pretty sure still to this day, you know, he'll work on, uh, you know, he works on anything. He'll work on anything, like, you know, whatever, whatever you want to build, he'll do it. Yeah. You know, and that was the thing, like, you know, we were building fast coyotes, mm-hmm. you know, we were building, um, you know, we we're building a lot of two J stuff. We would even work on some RBs. Yeah. Some LSs would get some love, you know, like they would, they would do it all. And then, you know, we did reefs, we did reefs car. Like that was, that right. was something iconic. That's an iconic that was something build. crazy, you know, and, you know, shout out to the team for doing that. Like it was, it was great, you know, it was great being a part. And, um, you know, that was like, we would do anything. And that's, that's the thing. Like that was the mentality where it was like, you can apply, you, if you can build one car, it's not hard. You can build any, Yeah. but like, you know, do a lot more research than just buying parts and just diving into a build. You know, doing a lot of research will save you a lot of time and a lot of money in the long run. Something that I always thought was really cool was like BMW, like racing lore, like, you know, mm-hmm. like history and stuff where you had uh, you had engines that they used to take from street cars that had over 100,000 miles on them. And in Germany, they would take these engines, these four cylinders. They were called an M10. The engine block was called an M10. Mm-hmm. And this came in like your E21 or, um, you know, like your normal three series daily driver that had 100,000 miles. And they would take the engine and they would take those blocks because those blocks were machined right because they lasted that long. Mm-hmm. They would take those blocks and they would set them outside behind the factories when they were building the, you know, race engines. Yeah. And they built a nasty cylinder head for it. And then they let that block outside for like a year. It's rumored that the, it's rumored. And this is like, I'm a little skeptical. I kind of believe it. Maybe some days I believe it, some days I won't. But it's rumored that the, the, the engineers that were building these things, they will go out to, they will go out behind the, behind the factory where the blocks are sitting in the sun and rain and whatever, and piss on these blocks. And it was like, you know, and these were the blocks that then got built and went into Formula One cars at the time. That so, were <laughs> turbo four cylinder making over a thousand horsepower because they in the eighties because they peed on the blocks because they peed on the blocks. You know, R. Kelly might be like, "Yo, that's yes. <laughs> <laughs> damn." <laughs> Yo, you went there with that one. Yo, I, I mean, like, you know, <laughs> shoot. So okay, so if you guys want to, if you guys want to build a BMW. Um, I said it's rumored. it's rumored. I said it's rumored, like man. Don't it. take it for a I fact. I feel like you believe it. Don't key. take it. I, I, you know, sometimes you believe stuff. You know, <laughs> sometimes you believe even... stuff. What, like, okay, what's another? What's like m- more, more lore that's like out there for you know? For what? Just motor, for, motor, for and, motorsport in general. I'm not saying BMW. I'm saying like motorsport in general. Mm, that's a good one. That's actually I like this question. There's um, a lot. You know, there's a lot of fact. Like, you know, like, like the one you said about the the Garretts. Yeah, like the precision stuff. The precision yeah. stuff. Well, I'm trying to think of one more. Guys, if you guys know one, put it in the chat below. Yeah, put it in the chat because we like to talk about you know, yeah, history. Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of this stuff never gets a lot of stuff never gets documented, but it's like widely known among Well, the most common one is which, uh, like the 2J and I guess Yamaha's role in that. But that's that's pretty much like stamped. That. Yeah, you know why? 
because Toyota couldn't build a good cylinder head, so they went to Yamaha to make it for them. Like they had a German engineer design the block, mm-hmm. and then they had a they had a motorcycle they had a motorcycle company actually. You can go to Yamaha and buy a piano, a motorcycle. I had, you can I buy had a Yamaha keyboard. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. you can buy. Yamaha makes whatever. You go yeah. to them and be like, "Yo, bro, uh, I need a refrigerator." Yamaha gonna make you something. <laughs> um, but you know, they they went to Yamaha for something. And you know what? You know what's really funny? If you took an an NA two J cylinder head, mm-hmm. and you took an a turbo two J cylinder head, yeah, and you fully race ported both of them, and I'm gonna get a lot of I'm gonna get a lot of slack for this. I've heard this, but again, you're gonna get a lot of slack. I'm gonna get a lot of slack for this. The all motor head ported is gonna make more power. That's that's a fact, though. That's. That's a widely accepted fact now because about four or five years ago, it was like, so it was like, oh, bro, you're shitting on the best cylinder head ever designed. No, you're not. No, the yeah. reason that the the reason that the two J GTE cylinder head mm-hmm. is the way that it is and why the why the manifolds don't line up is because they had to oddly sh- they had to oddly space the exhaust ports right. for the turbos to sit correctly in the car, mm-hmm. and now that impacts flow. The NA engines, the tur- the exhaust ports are spaced much better, yeah, and it flows better. Mm-hmm. people say oh but the intake ports are so much larger on the turbo it doesn't matter i'm forcing all the air in anyway yeah the the what you need is the air to flow out right that's why i think and another thing i'm gonna get another unpopular take that i got is that the s54 head isn't all it's cracked up to be the s54 head yeah so okay a lot of a lot of comparisons between the m52 s52 and the s54 mm-hmm. are that the s54 cylinder head is way way better Yes, the intake ports are way better. Mm-hmm. They're CNC from factory, or they, at least they look like it. And the Vano system is much better. Okay. Um, for those who for those who don't know, Vanos is um, the adjusting of the camshaft angle on the M52s and S52s. All you're doing is like it's like Toyota VVTi. It's nothing like VTEC. VTEC is a separate cam lobe. Um, but I was gonna say because I'm I asked Jordan that. And he kind of cleared that up, I think. Yeah. So the so what Vanos is, it's it's adjusting of the intake camshaft. What it's doing is a, is a, advancing at twenty degrees mm-hmm. for better mid range and better throttle response. And okay. the VVTi does a, does something very similar. If VVTi pretty much does the same thing. Anyway, the cylinder head on the S fifty four, there's a restriction. Like the the head, the exhaust port is smaller than the exhaust port on the M fifty two and S fifty two. Okay. And when you port them, okay, the S54, you can port it larger, but out of the box, you get a great flowing cylinder head that is relatively cheap, Mm -hmm. and it's very simple. The design is simple. The S54 has rockers, and it has like clips and shims and stuff, and all this stuff can pop out at high RPM, and it happens. You get people that build 800,000 horsepower S54s, and they constantly breaking rockers. The camshafts are torn up. The lifters, you know, the the shims are popping out, and the lash is all gone. But M52, they were all hydraulic lifters. And the issue with that is, at, I found the, the issue with that is at, at higher PM, or after like a long time, the oil, pump, the oil pump starts to drop off a little bit. Yeah. And it'll collapse the lifter and you'll float a valve and you'll piston right into the valve. Damn. But I was also revving these engines much like for daily, for like street right. duty. I was revving these engines higher than anybody else was at the time. Mm-hmm. There were people that were going to 8,000, but they were only, they were driving at the track. Right. So what's, what's, you know, a quarter mile at a time, you know, let's say you go to the track and you're doing 20 hits on a weekend, but you're only driving at the track. Yeah. I used to drive my car. I used to daily drive my car. And then it would get racked on the limiter 12, 15 times a day in mm-hmm. every single gear. Yeah. Like I was beating the hell out of the car. And then I realized I found the limit of it. And then we went solid lift to conversion. So now my car is my car is now solid lifter, high RPM. It goes and it has a ported head. So if you take a really good head already and now you port it, yeah, you're going way higher. So now we're going to 9,200 RPM on my engine, and the power band is like you're not just revving it for no reason. Yeah, we're at you know we're where it needs to be, and having that from you know having that from that racing pedigree, I feel like Yamaha could build them still in the heads. It'd be alright. <laughs> <laughs> so they, have, they still don't build cylinder heads i don't know if they do or not you know it's they probably do because they, anything that's like so also what about the um the uh lexus lfa uh-huh. that's also is that there's, yamaha? Like, there's like there's like four i don't know if there's i don't know if it's yamaha but there's that was because that, that car was sounds huge, amazing oh it sounds amazing but i, it I is, feel like yamaha played and a it's an amazing though. car it's a beautiful car amazing yeah. machine but that car is uh 
that car was a huge fail for Toyota. I know. It was such it was such a loss. They they built those cars on a loss. I feel like and they, they're they, pricey now. Like to get one oh of those. Oh my god, now? they're extremely expensive. You can't get one. Yeah. You can't get one, bro. We we can't afford this stuff. We're regular guys. <laughs> you know, but I remember seeing that commercial though the, for that car in the Super Bowl. I don't know which which year it was, but like Yeah, and it would break the they held the glass up. Yeah, and, dude. And it I was like, Yo, why am I? That was the one car that I would always You know what seen? they said? They were like you know what something I always thought was bullshit with that what? car? They're like, Oh, it has a digital uh tack. Tack, yeah. That's that's the that commercial. They're like, yo, it has a digital tack because it revs so fast it can't keep up. I'm like, that's bullshit. There's no way an analog tack can't keep up. <laughs> like maybe you just couldn't build a good analog tack, but bro, you had you know, you had like I don't know, you had a big block Chevy yeah. on an analog tack and the freaking thing is <laughs> the <laughs> yeah. thing is just whap, whap, whap. You're like, there's zero chance that this LFA is revving that fast that it yeah. can't freaking keep I think up. it was more just like a, a, a gimmick because it was like the sound. No, see, that's more lore, but they did that themselves. Yeah. That's like misinformation from Lexus. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. But no, it was cool. I, I, I wonder if they could actually break glass. I wonder if it could. I mean, they sound really good, dude. No, no, but they had that commercial where like they I held know, up a glass. I, and they brought, I wonder if it can do it. I wonder Possibly. if it actually can do it. Possibly. I think that was another uh, another car that failed too. Uh, was like the NSX. Yeah, the NSX was like a you know the newer one, not not the uh, yo even the ninety. Well, the newer one, I feel like you know it's a cool car. But it's, it failed. I don't think it. I don't yeah. think it did as well as it as expected. I I even think you know the old one is cool and everything, but it looks super great. But you know they're all. They're, they're nice, but to me, it is what it is, bro. At the end of the day, like, they're really cool cars. My thing is, I've seen some of those, like, um, you know, people do, like, the uh, the K-Series in those cars. There was one what, that was in the sick. NSX? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was one that was sick. Was Which NSX, car, though? Like, the 90s. Oh, 90s? Like, 91, yeah, yeah. 92. Those are cool. Um, but, you know, like, people do K-Series in those and stuff. But i seen one one time. I was, ra- you know, we ran out to... Uh, we're not to turnpike mm-hmm. and we're on the we're racing on we're racing out there and we're doing some roll stuff and then someone came out with a turbo nsx and he had the original engine that was turbo and that thing was making like eight nine hundred wheel horsepower on the original engine yo well you know he built it yeah but it was like uh it was like that v6 right you know and i always give someone props that sticks with the engine that came in the car like right. don't get me wrong i'm not a purist or anything but like if you stuck with the engine that's in the car i get people ask me all the time like yo why didn't you swap it or you'll put an ls or, yo, it sounds like a 2J. It sounds like this, it sounds like that. And then when I tell them it is the original BMW engine, they're like, yo, for real? Yes. <laughs> you know, bro, I, I, I went the first few times that I was at, at an event and, you know, the guys from 1320 were like, yeah. were like, yo, is this a 2J? And I'm like, no, it is the original engine that comes in this car. And they're like, hell yeah, man. You know, and people, you know, people give respect words do. Right. You know, and when you stick with something like that, I feel like. You know, you can continue to be part of that motorsport. In 20 years from now, they're going to be like, yo, you know, you if you had a Turbo E36, like that was a badass car to drive. You know, you have fun with it. Yeah. You know, so I feel like I feel like the, you know, the, the history with these cars will be there. For so sure. what does it cost to 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 build this? You didn't, So talk about your build, exactly what it has. Just give me like a quick. I'm going to give you a quick. Um, Currently right now, all wheel drive. The cylinder. Ha- okay, so I have a built cylinder. It has a. Uh, it's actually. I'm sorry. It's not a built cylinder. It is a ported cylinder, but it's all factory components. Okay. Um. So it has it has what's called a non vanal cylinder head. They had thicker valves from factory and dual valves from from factory. Okay. And that head is completely stock. It does not have, um, you know, aftermarket valve springs or aftermarket valves. So this head is stock. That has stock valves and stock valve springs. Um, the head is ported, mm-hmm. and the block is a simple off-the-shelf piston with a heavy-duty uh, wrist pin. Um, it has. Uh, I'm trying a different connecting rod out currently. Okay. Um, it's something I want to. I wanted to try out. It, it, it looks very good, and it looks very promising. Um, but I had a few. I had a few different connecting rods in the car before. And I'm just trying different things out. Okay. So, the rods that are in the car now, they work. They work very well, and I'm uh, I'm gonna keep that. You know, I'm gonna keep that a little close to the chest. Um, but it has a two eight crank still, and it's still an eighty four millimeter, eighty four. Are they an H beam or? It's X- an H beam. Okay. It's an H beam. Um, and then it uh, it has a sixty seven seventy five Pulsar turbo. You have a Pulsar Turbo. Oh, I got a Pulsar, baby. Yo, so you somebody- know what? Okay, this car has been through so many turbos, and I'm I, and I'm just gonna be quick. Okay, yeah. this car had when I originally built it, it had a HX40. Okay. Uh, then um, 
that the HX40 had to get rebuilt. And I put, I for the meantime, because I got bored, I bought an eBay Speed Daddy 35R. <laughs> it was like $140 shipped, bro. What? There was... There, Did the compressor housing blow up? Bro, let me tell you something about that turbo. <laughs> I put that thing on the car and... It was making like 550, 580 wheel horse, uh-huh. and I beat the snot out of it for like it beat the snot out of it for like a little while, and yeah. it was good, yeah. And then and then what happened before you uh, go to the next turbo? Oh, bro, it was only making like 580 wheel. I, wa- oh, okay. I was making 700 okay. before, so yeah. you know I want to go back to my HX40. <laughs> got you, got. There's something happened. So anyway, I went back to the HX40. Um, I put a Borg Warner on the car. Which one? Uh, I had a S- the FR or SXC 369. No, 360? I'm sorry, SXC 360. Six, I think That's it was the turbo I had, but that was was so you had a uh, ball bearing one. No, the SXC is the billet um, compressor wheel, still okay. journal bearing. Oh uh, yeah, okay. So mine was journal bearing too. Yeah. So, but the SXC was more money though. I paid the SXC was a little bit more. The, SXC, the 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 non SXC ones were like six seven hundred bucks. Exactly. Yeah. And then the SXC one was like nine hundred two thousand. Okay. Um. So you pay a little bit more. Yeah, you get I was a little nicer. You know, yeah. you get a little more flex. So the compressor wheel was uh was billet and it flowed it flowed better or whatever. Okay. Um. I had that turbo in the car. That turbo was the thing about Borg Warner turbos is that they are very reliable, but they are really massive. They sound so. It's like a jet plane. Yeah, though, they bro. sound good. They sound to, good. Like I think, I think they sound closer to like a T fifty one Armad. They do. They kind of sound like yeah. that. Whole set takes the cake, bro. That's what comes on like your, you know, yellow school bus. Yeah, they used, you know, used to come <laughs> around like that thing. You hear, <laughs> yo, you hear. I swear, dude. I sometimes still want to put a whole set on this car just the way, it, just because of how it sounded. Yeah, it was just. You heard the thing. You would. You could be like a, you know five six car lengths ahead of me i don't care bro you hear my turbo you know you hear <laughs> yeah i love that um so anyway i had the i had that on it those turbos are massive then i put a uh precision i put a precision 76 75 on the car okay and then after that that got messed up and that had to get rebuilt and then i put a boost lab turbo on the car and let me tell you something that boost lab turbo that was similar in size to precision outperformed it in every single way Really? It spooled better. It made more power per pound, and it was more reliable at the time. It was a Gen 2 dual bowl bearing 7675 versus the Boost Lab 7675. Um, actually, I'm sorry, the uh, 7875. It was like a hair bigger. Okay. But, you know, two millimeters on the compressor wheel, it should have spooled slower. It spooled better. You know, mm. like they, they build their own turbos down in Florida, and they do a good job. Right. Um, but anyway, I had that turbo on the car, and then I went... Then I after that I'd stay with Boost Lab for a while. Okay, but when I did this build, I put I wanted to switch things up. I wanted to you know I was like okay these are all rear wheel drive setup. These are all rear wheel drive. The okay. only time I I went all wheel drive was sorry the only turbo I've had on the all wheel drive is the um, the Pulsar sixty seven seventy five. So you can't even really do a comparison with power, I, I, right? I can, and I'm, I'll okay. tell you why I can. But the um, I, I wanted to switch things up with this build. Because I was tired of having that peaky after 5,000, after 5,500 RPM where yeah. like finally it comes on. You know, like the way my, my car is set up now, it has a 67 millimeter inducer. And what it is, it's, it's like a cheater turbo. So it's a 6775. It has a trim down compressor wheel that allows it to come on faster. Mm. So it'll make more power. It'll make about as much power as a 72 millimeter or 75 millimeter turbo, mm-hmm. but it'll spool like a smaller turbo because gotcha. of the smaller inducer right and with that now i have a car that comes on at 4500 rpm are this twin scroll uh it's it's a v-band inlet now oh it's okay gotcha. before i used to ha- i tried twin scroll open did that I tried to make a difference yeah, a you bit? know what 500 rpms maybe there's a there's a lot to do with the um with the turbo manifold design yeah i feel like depending on the turbo depending on the displacement of the engine the camshafts how you time your camshafts everything I feel like you can have an advantage on either one. Yeah. You know, they say that twin scrolls are restriction and open scroll will show better horsepower. Well, that's but, the restriction helps you spool up faster. No, but it'll help you spool up faster. Right. But then there's a, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot that has changed in turbocharger technology now. Yeah. In the last two years, dude, I'm these, still, I'm still like t- eight years ago. <laughs> these guys, there's, um, uh, there's a Subaru shop. I think it's, uh, I think it's prime. Okay. Okay. They do it all the time. They post this stuff up where they're changing turbine housings now and they're putting larger turbine housings and picking up spool and picking up horsepower. 
How though? What are they doing? It's just they're it's the like I said. The, the... No, it's just the turbine housing that they you know people just say all right, get a small turbine housing if you want to spool fast. Right. Because it would make sense. Yeah. But what ends up happening is that on a larger turbo, it becomes a restriction. So now the air is fighting to get into the turbocharger to spin that turbocharger. Mm-hmm. Not every engine is going to be the same. You're going to have some trial and error. Yeah. But they found that on those Subarus, the larger turbine housing is spooling better and making way more power for per pound. So, you know, oh. the old way of thinking is not, you know. Yeah, I'm still stuck on. I'm still stuck on. Uh, we all are. you know. <laughs> but I mean, some of that stuff is, I mean, no matter what, when it comes to cars, like there's certain things that no, will never change, mm-hmm. you know. So I, I just assume the same thing with turbos. But I yeah, guess no, but turbos. Technology they, they, has advanced. Technology has changed. You know, you got they're They're constantly changing in, um they're, they're constantly looking at aerodynamics. Right. And, you know, material like Apex Turbo came out with that turbo that the it's like it's like four or five millimeters like the center of it when mm-hmm. you're looking at another turbo it's like you know the center is like 10 millimeters right that extra surface area allows that turbo charger to perform better mm. so you know they're always going to push the limits for competition right and that's where it all that's where it all begins you know so, you that stuff they they you get the engineers that make stuff crazy for competition yeah and then that stuff makes it to street cars and then we have fun Right. You know, but this technology, they probably had that in Formula One. They might have had that technology, you know, 10 years yeah, ago. we get it. Yeah, exactly. Actually, not That's 10 years ago. Because they, it's not 10 years ago, but. <laughs> I, I, get, I get the concept. I get the concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now the Pulsar Turbo, what made you go with the Pulsar? Oh, so I went with the Pulsar Turbo. Sorry, I keep getting off track. No, you're good. You're good. Um, the Pulsar Turbo, uh, I wanted to go, like I said, I wanted to go with something that was going to be different. Um, that was going to have a larger turbine than a, than a compressor. I've always had the opposite. Okay. And I've noticed it gave me a laggier setup always. So I was like, all right, let me do it this way. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to enjoy it. You know, I'm going to try this out, see if it works. And it en- I ended up, you know, I ended up hitting it right on the money. You know, I put the car together. It made a thousand horsepower. It first off, this car at Wayskate, which is like 18, 19 pounds of boost, always, my car on the 78 or 76 millimeter, always used to make like 640, 650 wheel. We like, like, we like any adjustment. On Wayskate. Like on gate, like 18, 18, 18 20 pounds. Yeah, okay. And uh, this thing, the way the way I put it together this time on 18, 20 pounds is making like 810 or 811 wheel. But it's all a drive. I dynoed it in rear wheel drive. Gotcha. Yes. So the transmission that this uses is a 335 six speed training okay. um, from an N54 car. And um, if you unplug the transfer case, the, uh, the car's rear wheel drive. Uh, okay. that's I'm why talking. i'm still in that's why i'm still in the testing and development of this setup got you um i haven't posted any i haven't posted any real world numbers yet yeah. the reason for that is because every time we've tried to power the transfer case it uh it it forces the clutches and jams them and is burning it up okay and okay. there is a transfer case that will work that's all man that's all uh like analog where it's, it doesn't have any electronics in it, right. no sensors or, you know, wiring, but I don't like the, I don't like the torque split. So the torque split on that one is, uh, is pretty much like 60, 40, which ah, is a lot. And I don't right. need that much. Right? I don't need that much front drive in my car. My car is pretty much set up. My car used to work at like 800 wheel. Yeah. So if I make a thousand wheel horsepower and I split it 60, 40, I'm sending 400, pretty much 400 to the front, to the front. and 600, 600 to the rear. Yeah. I can get away with an 80-20 split much better. An 80-20 split will suit my car much better. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing also is that you can vary the lock. You can vary the lock where, let's say you launch the car and you have it more front bias. Right. And then, you know, towards the top end, let's say at 130 or 140 miles an hour, you kick it all to the back. Yeah. And now, you know, the car is really pulling harder because you have none of that drivetrain loss. It's right. all your horsepower to the rear wheels and it's not spinning, you know, like. That's what the Audi guys are doing with the, uh, yeah, with the, the TRS with the, yeah. and, and the RS3s. And, uh, they have their Haldex controllers yeah. and stuff like that. So they do they the same really thing. Like, um, they launch the same way, all the drive, I think. And then up top, they don't even need to have the um, all power going to all four wheels. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they go to the front because things right. are, yeah. The, yeah. At that point, it might have been opposite actually because you, it was something that you wouldn't think of. But mm-hmm. I, I get, it. I get the concept. Yeah, a lot of those guys they were they were launching those cars with too much power going to the rear wheels. Yeah, and the cars just you know like small diffs. The drive shaft's not really made for it. Like that right. stuff is not you know it's not really made for it. Right. So like when you had the hull control, you're giving it too much to the rear, and now you know mm-hmm. damaging parts. 
So you made more power with this turbo? I made way more power with this turbo. And but the thing is that I changed a lot. You know, I, the cylinder head is not ported. So like okay, I had an unported cylinder head making less power at the same boost. That could probably be attributed to that. Now the good news is, is that if anyone gaps me with this setup, I still have my boost, my trusty old Boost Lab 78 millimeter that they made a nice V-band turbine housing for me. Yeah. Shout out to Boost Lab. Um, that I can throw on the car and do a back-to-back -back comparison. Okay. You know, which I'm very interested in doing. You know, I have a dyno, so I can strap the car down, dyno the car with this, see what it makes, pull the turbo off, pull the other one on, and do some testing. I'm confident that the 7875 will make more power. I'm, I I don't doubt it for a second because the it's it's physics. The wheel is larger. It's gonna yeah. it's gonna suck in more air. But this isn't the same size though, is it? No, this is a sixty-seven. Right. Remember so. the other one. The other one has about the same size turbine wheel. Right. Which will allow the flow, but the induce the the compressor wheel where it's sucking the air in mm -hmm. is much smaller on this one. So I feel like it's limited by that. So yeah, I have a Pulsar turbo custom intercooler. Um, I have a oil filter, which you don't see in a lot of these cars. Is an oil filter relocation kit that comes with. Uh, this guy Travis, he makes a he makes an intake plenum and um, intake runner design mm -hmm. to go with the ported head. Okay, that it uh, it's a much better runner design for high horsepower applications. Okay, so I think all those parts together really made it make way more. It made it it took the most out of my setup, right. you know, and it really showed in you know it showed in the dyno and it showed in the drivability on the street with the same exact cams. The car's way way better, more responsive, mm -hmm. and it carries more up top. And I'm I'm. Dude, I'm driving the car around a thousand wheel, and I'm like, wow, like this car never came on like this. You know, it comes on, and I'm and I'm even, I haven't even used the nitrous yet. Oh, so it has nitrous. Oh yeah, my car. I'm sorry. Yeah, my car. <laughs> I run nitrous. I run nitrous on the car to spool it, and I used to run nitrous on the car to spool it. Now, you know, I have I have the nitrous in the car, but I haven't ran it yet. Yeah. You know, and I'm but I'm interested in once I fi once I fully figure out the all wheel drive, mm -hmm. and um, which I'm confident that we will. Once I forgot the all wheel drive and it hooks very good and then I could hit it with way more power down low, I'm gonna hit it with the nitrous. So am I from roll racing? You you roll run? dig whatever. Like okay. I this car my my goal for this car is to just pull up on blacktop, on bare blacktop, two step the car and just you know. I wanna I wanna do back to back eight ninety passes on the street with no with no prep, no nothing. That's my goal for this car. And it has the it has the you know, it has the power to weight to do it. Yeah. You know, this car, even with the all wheel drive, this car only weighs 3000 pounds. That's light, dude. It's not, I, that's how I built the car. Yeah. You know, it, it weighs 3000 pounds. It has a 305 tire in the rear, 275 tire in the front. And you know, it can put the power down. I'm extremely confident it can put the power down. And, um, that was the entire reason going back to, you know, why, why I built the car the way I built it is because, I got tired of driving and just painting black lines everywhere I went. <laughs> you know, it sounds like fun. And, yo, it is fun. You know, all yeah. the Mopar guys, bro, do your thing, man. Punch that sucker. But at the end of the day, spinning ain't winning. Oh, that's true. And, you know, I I, uh, I like, you know, I like, I like racing. I like, you know, being competitive. And, you know, you go and race these guys and, you know, Dre said it. Before he knew my car was all-wheel drive, he was like, you know, I, not to not to diss me, but he's like, yo, you know, there's no there's no real point in running it because you know it's a rear-wheel drive car. But then once they told him it was all-wheel drive, he he yeah. knew immediately. He's like, yo, you know, he can hit it with, with more power. It'll be interesting. Yeah, and I'm excited to see that. He said, if your car ain't doing a two sixty to one thirty, then don't I mean, I don't think it'll do a two, but you know, <laughs> sixty to one thirty is just one unit of measurement. It's right. not, you know, it doesn't tell the whole story, but it is it is a big factor. It's a big factor. But there were times, dude. There were times I hopped in this car. And on the nitrous, the thing was doing like a, it, on the nitrous, it was do like a four zero or like a three nine. Mm -hmm. I was starting third gear. Rear wheel drive. Rear wheel drive. Right. On a fresh set of tires, I did it, it, but it was invalid. It was like the slope was, you know, the slope was whatever. Yeah. Um, but, um, dude, it was that uh, four, four oh flat in one gear. I used to gear, I would gear this car very long. So my car in third gear, my car in third gear will do a 6130 on the nitrous. Just third gear alone. Third, third gear alone. I put the car in third, turn the nitrous on at like 3,500, 4,000 RPM, comes on, done. One gear. I don't have to shift it. But if I'm shifting it, my car would do a 4.5 mm. without the nitrous, you know, because I got, 
you know, you lose time from the shift. And then right. also the nights just made it come on way better. So third gear or so fourth gear is your money gear, basically? Or uh, your one to one? I mean, yeah, fourth gear, fourth, fifth gear still pulls. But yeah, I, I, I've driven this car on the street over 200 miles an hour. Don't arrest me. Um, <laughs> mul multiple times. If you see that video I have with the K-Series MR2, mm. um, a friend of mine. In fact, uh, the MR2 was moving. Pff, bro, that MR2. Listen, K-Series MR2 seemed to be, they seemed to be my kryptonite. Yeah. Because I go, I go. And this is something that, this is something that, you know, people can nitpick or whatever, but you go, people go out racing on a weekend in the street. You go out, people go out road racing, they go out to the park, whatever, whatever they got to do, right? Yeah. Nobody posts their losses. It's like, bro, 20 people went out, 20 people won? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's true y'all fight you know every yeah y'all had some much. wins y'all had some losses nobody ever wants to post it they always want to make it look like they've always had a w yeah and that's not the case bro that's not the case i don't rock with that i'll you know i've always i've always punched higher you know and there are people that you know they're looking for a gw all the time yeah. i've always punched higher i've never went to go pick on anybody that you know that that I knew that I knew I could take. Yeah. I never went to pick on anybody like that. Right. Perfect example. In Texas, Dan Rue was talking to somebody about racing a GTR. Yeah. And, you know, this other GTR was supposedly making more power than him, but it was like on a shitty tire setup. Yeah. And it was like on a cob. It was some bullshit build. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the guy might be tight, but whatever. It was it was on a cob, bro. Like, who, we don't use cob. Even when, even before cob, you know, did their whole EPA thing, you had a cob on a Subaru. That's what you had. Yeah, okay, what you covers, yeah. put that on a GTR, bro. Anyway, right. um, they're talking and they're getting ready to run, and I'm like, "Yo, can I hop in?" And I had me and the MR2 had just raced like three or four times, and me and the MR2 are there and we're talking to the guy, and the guy has a, um, it ends up being that both MR2s I raced are like K, they were K24 76 85 MR2s with mm -hmm. like dog boxes. Yeah, bro, these are 1200 horsepower MR2s. With a dog box transmission. This ain't your grandma's MR2 with a 600 wheel horsepower K series and a factory, you know, factory right. transmission. That's this is not what that is. Right. And um anyway, we uh, you know, we we I, I was always aiming higher, punching higher, and we go and we race, and um uh I see the GTR and you know, Dan Rue, the the two GTRs are lining up and they're like playing, you know, they're playing, you know, games to jump. I hop in the far lane. And the three of us hit at the same time, bro. And when I tell you, I left this red GTR, and then Dan Rue came up behind me and just, whoosh. I mean, you got a fourteen hundred horsepower GTR, bro. It's just gonna be out. Yeah. But at the time, my car, at the time, I think my car was making like a thousand fifty, something like that. Mm. You know. But it was fun, dude. I, you know, I was always aiming higher. You know, I drove Did you guys all take off at the same time? And uh, yeah, it was like they were playing. You know, they were playing uh, staging games, and then, you know, you know how it is. You're always trying to get the jump on right. the next person. Right. Um. And then, you know, we took off at the same time, but it was, you know, it was a, it was, it was a drive, bro. It was a drive. Like I, there's a guy with, has a, uh, this other guy too. He got a Viper. Yeah. Um, cool guy. He has a, uh, he has a fifth gen Viper. What color is it? Red. Okay. Nitrous, supercharged. Um, he got a Motec now, I think, mm -hmm. or he might've had the Motec before, but anyway, one year I went and my injectors got clogged at 2K, at Texas 2K Pro. You go to show out and your injectors get clogged on a run. Like I was, I was, I was embarrassed, you know, like yeah. you go out and you go do that. And then like he had me and in the video, it was close. Like I, I, if my injector, if my car didn't misfire, I would have had him. So then I go back the next year, right? This was, this was, uh, this was like a, it was a great race. This was me, that Viper. And anyway, that Viper makes like 12, whatever. It's like 11, 1200 horsepower. Yeah. And the, uh, and then they had a, there was a tuned down pipe. Uh, race gas mclaren 720s another you know another super cool car that cookie cutter those things they do 406 130 yeah and uh we're three wide in texas and bro you're gonna tell me any 36 is gonna keep up with a 720s maybe you could tell me any 36 is gonna keep up with a fifth gen viper on nitrous and a supercharger <laughs> he didn't we me and him didn't run the nitrous that run yeah but um dude we had a good run he had me by like car and a half two cars but, you know, I feel like on the nitrous, it would have definitely evened it out. Yeah. And then the other thing also is like, I wasn't driving the car as hard as I, you know, as, as hard as I wanted to. Right. Because I had just, 
um, I had just had to do a major repair to the car right before Texas. I, uh, I was doing some testing and, um, hit a really bad pothole, like while the wheel locked up at like 80 miles an hour yeah. and it ripped the wheel off the car and, uh, you know, car fell down. It broke a bunch of stuff and the transport was coming the next day, you know? And I was like, man, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to make it. And then it just, you know, it just clicked in me. It's like, yo, fix that shit. Let's go. Yeah. And I went out. I got the parts next day. I was able to fix it. And then I didn't tell anybody. Like, for some reason, everybody found out my car. Every find out, everybody found out I crashed the car. Yeah. And I, you know, I didn't tell anybody, but everybody that was on the transport knew. Right, right. So then the next day comes, I fix the car. And then I show up at the transport. And everybody, quiet. Dead quiet, bro. People are like, no way this guy did this. Like this car, I just saw videos of this car in pieces. And you know, like I, I did it. And I did it for plenty of events. You know, like if, you know, if I was racing the car the next day and it mm-hmm. didn't even have an engine in it. Like, you know, you haul ass, you get out there, you know, you turn in wrenches in the middle of the night, you're getting it ready. You throw, you get the motor in fluid, boom, boom, boom. Hit the road. You do a test hit on the back block, third, fourth gear. Mm, all right, feels good. Let's go. <laughs> but uh, after I did those repairs, that when the... Uh, after I did those repairs when the, when I hurt the car when I when the wheel ripped off yeah the alignment was really off so if you look at that video uh, insert video here um, <laughs> it uh bro the car was pulling hard to the right and I really had to steer it to the left to like to keep it you know to keep it yeah. going and you see me bro I'm all over the road I'm like I, I took like a I took like a three lane I took like a three lane walk yeah, on a like, Texas Whoa. highway <laughs> you know I mean I had the McLaren covered so it wasn't a problem and right. nobody else was on the road thank God but. You know, the rest of that weekend, I'm like, all right. And then I raced the uh, I raced the K Series MR2. That was fun. That was another close race. Um, and I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure Dan Rue was that same was that mm-hmm. same trip to Texas. It was but a good time. Say it was fast. He said it was a fast car. Yeah, I'm sure he didn't expect a you know raggy yeah. ass BMW to keep up with him. You know, that's probably low. what he was thinking. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you see that thing, you're like, yo, this shit's regular traffic, bro. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> but yeah. nah, man. I uh, like I said, I always tried to I always tried to punch up. You know you. At the end of the day, you don't, you know, you don't go picking on people that you know. You got, you know, GW hunters are gonna be GW hunters, and that's street racing. That'll always be there. Mm-hmm. But if you're doing this stuff for fun, like, what's the point? Yeah, you're gonna go out, and you're gonna tell everybody, yo, I got the baddest car on the planet, and I won, I, I beat everybody this weekend. Meanwhile, there's five videos of you, you know, honking like a moron and jumping on the first <laughs> jump. Like, at the end of the day, you know, that ain't fun. Yeah, it's become the sport lately. It seems like it's been like that for a long time. Absolutely, bro. For sure. So, what's next for you? Who are you trying to race next? Uh, I'm going to race, I'm going to race myself first. I'm, I'm going to get <laughs> okay. that. I'm going to get those. I want to get those 890 passes on the street. And then, um, and then I'm going to hit a few events and I want to, I want to run a few people. I'm really, I'm really interested in running Dre. That's definitely something that I want to do. In what car? Um, in whichever one he wants. I know that TTRS is fast. The M240 looks like he's still, you know, working out some kinks, but both cars are going to be really quick. Peppa's car is very fast. People, yeah. you know, people want to talk a lot, but Peppa proved himself, man. He went out there, he did his thing. That car works. Um, you know, all these, you know, big shops. Shout out to, uh, you know, shout out to these guys that have their G80s, that they're doing fast things with them. Mm-hmm. You know, but I feel like it's a different, you know, it's a different thing. You got, you got newer automatic cars that the transmissions are very efficient. They're not like old automatics where you got yeah. these levers and, you know. You know, you pull it and you're like, oh, hopes and dreams. My horsepower is coming. But, you know, you have, I, I like to race car stuff like that where it's like a manual versus an automatic or a DCT. Yeah. I've enjoyed that because I get more, I get more satisfaction out of that. You know, that's always something like, you know, H pattern has always been my thing and I'm always having that fun with that. Yeah. You know, keep the manuals alive, whatever. <laughs> you know, that's me. But uh, at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's something I like. So what am I going to do? Not the way I like. No, I, I hear you. I mean, I, I would love to get into a manual car again, but I, I can't. I can't. Nah, the ZF8 works better in the Super anyway. It's, well, yeah. No, I'm saying for fun, just for fun, not not yeah. to like, not to challenge anybody or be street racing with it. But it'd be fun. I think it's it's cool. You kind of have to have that kind of weekend car with you know manual weekend. Yeah, car. Yeah, you know, I like it. I like it's like grassroots. You know, it's like older yeah. motorsports stuff. It's it's like your grandmother couldn't drive this, right? You know, and that was something. That's something that like you know, really happened when manufacturers, it really started when these manufacturers wanted to sell more of these supercars. Mm-hmm. You know, they, uh, 
they ended up making all these cars automatic because customers couldn't break them. Right. And then, you know, all these rich guys that don't know how to drive stick, a lot of them do, but all these rich guys that were never car enthusiasts that don't know how to drive stick, they can get into the scene. Yeah. And they think, you know, I don't respect that at all. I don't, I don't respect that in the slightest. I respect you being into cars and stuff, but you know, you getting, you getting the automatic at the time. Cause this was also back when, you know, they had like, if, uh, it was like 07, 08. Right. The automatic, like those supercars, they were they were pretty much manuals, but they had automatic pumps to do the shifting and actuate the clutch. It wasn't like DCT um, or DSG or, you know, mm-hmm. all these PDK. It wasn't like that. It was like an, it was like BMW had SMG. It was like that. The SMG, okay. SMG was absolute trash. Trash. Abs- SMG is easily... That, that's in the E46, right? E46, yeah. E60 M5. Mm-hmm. Some other cars have it. SMG is easily the worst thing they've ever made. Ever. Ever, bro. I mean, they're not using it anymore, right? Thank God. <laughs> but D, but then they made DCT. DCT was much better. But guess what? Now they got the ZF8. The ZF8 is better than the DCT. Right. I bro, think, you launch yeah. a car, you're loaded up on the torque converter, ready to rock. Bro, you think... Bro, when you go to... When you go to... Uh, when you go to like a track event, TX2K, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. Whenever you look at the time schedule and you see the GTR class first, it's going to be a long day. Because all they do is break. <laughs> Bro, you're launching. Why you, why you think, you know, Kimbo GTR, Mac Bronson, why do you think he put, you know, an automatic transmission in the car? Because he's tired of just. What does he have, a TH400? He got something like that. Yeah, yeah. pretty sure it's a TH400, bro. That car is nasty. Yeah. I followed that build since like he got it, man. Mm-hmm. That, you know, because he used to be up in Connecticut. That props to that, man. But yeah. Um that those GTRs, bro, they just they come up to the line and it dumps the clutch. Shit breaks. <laughs> they and then they they remedy it by having these huge, huge tires where it's wrinkles aside. We want to take some of the cushion, but bro, it's gonna break. When you're launching a car and you're loaded up on the converter mm-hmm. and the entire driveline is preloaded, bro, it's going to take off. There's zero there's zero chance that DCT is going to be better than an automatic. They actually have uh they actually have some sort of trans brake uh option now, mm-hmm. but you have to push a bunch of buttons and it's like a whole it's always but apparently be a bunch of buttons, apparently bro. it works. Yeah, um, let it work, bro. Launching the it. thing is also is that the technology for that transmission was designed a long time ago. Right, right. And it advanced to here yeah and now it's no longer supported Mm -hmm. what is supported zf8 and then they're already working on the next thing that's going to be better right you know it's never it never stops growing and you got to remember it's like yo you better get with the times or get with the past because yo tomorrow what you thought was new is going to be old so S- so SMG is out the out the question. Yeah, SMG is trash, bro. DCT trash. works, um, especially if you got a track card uh, like circuit track card. Yeah, yeah. DCT works. It's just very fun, fast. It's fun. Um, but uh, even the ZF8, I've seen it on, you know, like I've seen people use them on circuit cars and stuff like that. It's just very fast, really direct. And I think it's great. You know, they're using ZF8s in everything. Yeah. You know, you got a, you know, AMG, Mercedes, they've had it. You know, all the uh, Chryslers have it. BMW has it. Bro, it's it is a it is a very good transmission, and you know, Pure did really good things with it, where they designed a very good setup. Where every car on the list got a Pure training, yeah, you know, and that's it. So they're doing something right. Nah, facts. Yeah, I need he, to get he, mine. He did, you know, Chris Miller does. You know, he builds a good transmission. That's this cool. is still this is still the this is still the baddest Streety Thirty Six you will ever see. This is one of the highest horsepower 36s that you'll see on the street that has been consistent over the years. You have to, you have to watch um, how you said that. I don't know why, because I feel like... No, it's not that. It's like I show a lot of respect to, you know, to the guys who've been in this platform mm-hmm. before me because they paved the way. Yeah. You know, I, I took it and I did something different with it, mm-hmm. you know, but they still paved the way. They had their automatics in the car. They're working. They're making a lot of power. They do, yeah. you know, they're using a lot of different things and they're, they're doing great things. Um. But to me, like, you know, I drive my car in the street all the time. I enjoy it. There's, you know, there's a guy in North Carolina, Jimmy Baco, bro. That guy, that guy has done so much for the, him and CES, John at CES Motorsports. Yeah. Those guys have done so much for this community and they'd never get a lot of recognition for it. So, you know, I always show respect, you know, to the guys who were in, you know, who were in this before me, who yeah. paved the way because, yo, without them, what it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know anything. I would have mm-hmm. still been, you know, 
I was still been trying to figure out like, yo, what pump do I put in this? What cam timing works? What this, what that? And those guys, they did a lot. And Jimmy helped me a lot through my build. Me and Jimmy talk all the time. You know, he's uh he's a very smart man. And yo, his his car, he might be, he might have the baddest E36 on the planet when he's finally done. Wow. Jimmy Baco has a crazy engine, big old precision 80 something. It's a huge turbo. Mm -hmm. He got a built 6R80 with a Motec. Car is nasty. It's got like a pretty sure it's got like a Ford nine inch or whatever, maybe an 8.8. But yo, it's got everything in it, and it has a cage. That car's that car's gonna go sevens. I have no doubt in my mind that car will go sevens easily. Damn. Not easily, but you know what I mean. Like yeah. once it's dialed in, right? That 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 fucker will go to the track, and he's gonna be like this seven seven <laughs> sevens, and he'll drive his track, which don't really count, bro. You live in North Carolina, like the track's like fifteen minutes away. Yeah. <laughs> that don't really count too much. But I'm gonna let it. I'm gonna let it slide. Yeah. If you're in New York and you drive to the track and you drive home, you're risking a lot, bro. Yeah. That's like a say that to Jordan. <laughs> 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 bro like that's why you know but that's the thing that's why i want to do the all-wheel drive because i can get the numbers that my car could get at the track rear wheel drive on the street mm. yeah that's the thing i pull up at a red light ain't no minivan ain't no minivan surprising me bro <laughs> you know ain't no Toy toyota sienna or you know honda odyssey gapping me from a 60 foot <laughs> that ain't happening zero chance so oh man all right man well um this conversation has been great. I know it's a little super technical, but... Man, it went a little long. You might have to do like a two-part release. Nah, what you mean? <laughs> it's probably like two hours. Yeah? I think so. What time we start? I don't know what time we started, bro. You what were setting up it? for a while. Oh, my watch died. Dude, that's crazy. Oh, that's why you didn't know. It's 4 a.m. Holy crap. Dude, Bruh. my shit was stuck. Damn. Your battery died. Okay. Well, tell the viewers where to find you, bro. Um... Southside Motorsports in Deer Park. That's my shop. Um, my Instagram is uh, Francis Von Louis, and uh, you catch me in the streets. You know, Tri-State BMW meets. I like to go to North Carolina to uh, Streetcar Takeover. Super fun event. Those guys they run a great event at Z Max and uh, FL2K. Also, I want to go to that. I want to do mm -hmm. a bunch of events this year. Yeah. So I might go to Bimmer Invasion in in a few weeks. It's over in Orlando. I got a few peeps in Florida. I got to go check, you know, my people down there. So cool. It's ain't a call out, but I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, appreciate you, bro. Um, guys, make sure you guys are listening on all streaming platforms. Make sure you guys like, share, comment, and subscribe if you are watching. And I will catch you on the next one. Peace.